Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Rain has arrived across parts of B.C., a welcome relief for wildfire crews battling blazes and the thousands of people forced from their homes. But there's also tension, especially in the shoe swap, as some people feel they uh, are abandoned by fire crews and have many complaints about communication. We'll check in first with one of our reporters in the Okanagan, and at 1 o'clock, we'll take you live to an update from the provincial government and BC wildfire officials. I'm Belle Puri with Dan Burrett. Welcome to an extended version of BC Today. is some optimism from fire officials in BC. Rain, higher humidity and cooler temperatures are giving crews some much needed help as wildfires continue to burn. Still, it will be some time before everyone forced from their homes can return. The CBC's Brady Strachan has been busy reporting in the Okanagan these past few weeks and he joins us live from Penticton today. Hi, Brady. Hello, Belle. Tell us, first of all, what's the weather like there today? Yeah, it's, it's a little cooler than it was last week, much cooler actually. Uh, we have a little bit of wind, but not the, the really concerning wind that caused all the growth of this fire. The humidity is up, and so that is giving fire crews a, a chance to really start to do the, the heavy lift of putting out this fire in all the places it has spread. So things are promising. We have heard from fire crews on the firefight. The smoke I mentioned is lifting. That's also giving a chance uh, for a look from the air at the devastation of the structures, of course, which is uh, is very sad and what uh, we will be dealing with, the uh, uh, officials and uh, homeowners will be dealing with in the coming days. Brady, as we heard yesterday from fire officials, they estimate that uh, about 90 or so properties in West Kelowna and West Bank First Nation uh, believe to have been uh, destroyed. Today we're getting updates that about 84 uh, properties, not structures, have been damaged. Uh, but as you said, it will be some time before we get the full extent. You're also hearing some stunning tales of survival in and amid the flames. Yeah, Dan, I'm, I'm actually here in Penticton today, just uh, south of Kelowna, and we've met with hiker Bernard Cloutier. He, a week ago, he was caught up in the fire that destroyed a lot of the area in the Cathedral Provincial Park. That, uh, that happened about a week ago, and uh, it was a massive plume of smoke that anyone in the Okanagan would have seen going up into the sky. We could see it in Kelowna, uh, more than 100 kilometers away. Cloutier was just about to finish a three-day solo trek. He was less than a day away from his destination when he saw the fire raging towards him in this big plume of smoke. He had a satellite phone. He got in touch with his contacts with BC Parks. And then he had to wait 30 hours for rescue. As a helicopter tried to find him, it wasn't able to land amidst the smoke and the fire burning around him. But eventually, they were able to drop a note on a weight telling him to walk back through an area that was already burned where they could reach him and land the helicopter and bring him to safety. So we're, we're speaking with Cloutier now about his harrowing tale. He was lifted out of there, the last person to escape the Cathedral Provincial Park before that fire swept through the area. He says he... he uh, estimates he, about four hours later the massive inferno burned through the area he was sheltering in so a story of gratitude a story of faith and survival mm. and uh, and the amazing work by penticton search and rescue who he says saved his life it's so lucky so lucky now we also know it's been percolating over the last few days that there's a lot of tension uh, especially in uh, the shushwap uh, region what can you tell us about that yeah, we're hearing stories of people who have stayed behind to fight the fires in their rural neighborhoods uh, against the orders, against the, the direction of uh, officials and fire crews as they want people in evacuation orders to leave. And we're hearing stories that now they're having trouble getting supplies in. People, they, they need gas and fuel for their generators, uh, for their equipment, and they are saying that officials are stopping those deliveries. And so I, I spoke this morning to someone who has been through this before. 
a man named Michael Fenwick Wilson, who in Rock Creek stayed back in 2015 to fight the fires encroaching on his rural area. They too were told by officials to leave, and they didn't. They stayed, and they believe they saved their landscape and homes from burning. In fact, they later were compensated by the BC government for the firefighting work that they did. So he's watching the situation and you know, he, his perspective is that officials need to work with people who are staying back and need to work with them and use them as a resource because the fire crews can't be everywhere. It's, it's a contentious topic. Safety is, uh, at, uh, is, a, is a matter here, and officials will say safety is the top priority. But these are the discussions that are going on as this situation is unfolding in the shoe swap. CBC reporter Brady Strachan live in Penticton. Thank you, Brady. And you will be able to see and hear Brady's report tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6 and at 11 on CBC TV, CBC Gym, and on CBC YouTube. Brady, thanks again. We know you're working your, your, your uh, behind off, you and the crews. Please stay safe. <laughs> and we want to hear from you. Thanks you for can, having me. You can give us a call at 1-800-825-5950. On the Lower Mainland, 604-669-3733, star or pound 690 on your cell phone. And you can email us, bctoday at cbc.ca. And we have a call now from Scotch Creek. Uh, let's say good afternoon to Arthur. Hi there. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, just thinking outside the box a little bit, there's a lot of tension on both sides here. The people that have stayed in the evacuation area of the North Shushwap or any fire area, and the government, BC Wildfire. Let's, let's put out a phone number that residents, people who have stayed behind can phone to a logistics person who can create a simple database. Who we are, where we are, what it is we think we can contribute to this emergency situation, whether it be first aid, driving, logistics, bookkeeping, or actual firefighting equipment, or uh, road building, whatever it might be. Give us a phone number that we can call so we can have a simple database. If BC Wildfire or the government needs the resources that are available within the community here, they got a list, somebody they can call, and we can go to work. We just want to help. We just want to go to work. And are you under an order or an alert of any kind? Yes, I'm under order. Okay, but you're still home. Uh, yes, I'm still home. Why did you decide to stay, Arthur? Uh, 35 years as a logging contractor, 20 years with a contract for BC Wildfire. Uh, I've seen this coming, uh, this fire situation, for over two weeks. My neighbors and I, we have pumps, hoses, evacuation, egress routes. We have a plan. We've got dry food. We've got... We're extremely prepared. Not everybody was. Mm -hmm. So some people should be leaving, absolutely. There's people that can help within this community. Give us a phone number. Let us register. We just want to work with you. Mm -hmm. We just want to help. It's our community. Arthur, uh, we know that uh, people with similar concerns and, and some some uh, strong opposition to, to these, these rules about getting out, uh, uh, took that those messages and complaints directly to the Premier yesterday. His response is that he, he's urging people to follow the orders that are given by wildfire officials that are enforced by the police, etc., because he argues that public safety is number one and that if somebody runs into trouble who has not left, that emergency crews then have to go in and put themselves at even further risk to rescue that person. Do you think there's a balance here whereby uh, if someone chooses to stay and lets authorities know that, that they assume that risk and perhaps understand that crews might not be able to get in, get in and get them out if they need it? Absolutely. I mean, you have to have a plan. You have to be able to, you know, work safely in a situation. Nobody wants to put themselves at risk. So, again, let us offer our, our support. Give us an opportunity. Let us set up a little database. It won't take a whole bunch. So we know what resources are available still within the community. Get an actual, actual count of how many people are still in the community. And 
it's cool, it's calm, it's raining. The fire's not going to take another great big run like it did last week. Mm-hmm. Here's our opportunity to make some real progress, to lower the tensions, the anxiety in the community. Let us help. Arthur, last question. We really appreciate your time. You're not the only person that has is, that is decided to stay uh, despite an evacuation order, but also who has experience when it comes to logging. We have, we've spoken with retired firefighters, retired pilots who want to get involved, perhaps not on the front lines, but maybe helping with logistics. Uh, what would you think of setting something like that up uh, formally beyond just a, uh, the registration you're talking about? Well, absolutely. There's lots of talented business people, retired logistics minded people in this community that could offer something to this emergency situation. It's unprecedented. Let's utilize the resources we've got. Arthur, we really appreciate your call. Thank you very much. And uh, please, please stay safe. Uh, uh, We know it's a a tough time for a lot of people across the province. Absolutely. And Dan, we have another caller, uh, Baria from uh, Blind Bay. Uh, Hi there. Hi. I'm actually not from Blind Bay. I'm from Lee Creek, but I'm calling from Blind Bay. Okay. Yeah. What can you tell us about your situation? Well, uh, in the community where I live, it's rural, it's dirt road, and most of my neighbors have lost their houses, but I am lucky, my dad, and we're, we have our places still, and there's four. I think there's four houses left, of, and it's mostly all my family because we all live near each other, but... The it, the only reason it's still there is because there are a team of local people. There's pockets of teams of local people all across the North Shore. It's a long area with five different hamlets stretching out across the lake. And it, anyway, we happen to have still have our house at this point. So does my sister. She lives in Solista, but she was there yesterday. She was allowed to go in, and she was having to bucket water out of the creek and dump it onto spot fires that were happening around her place and her neighbors have protected her place. And that's the only reason it's there. And it's just so upsetting. And I was just trying to send supplies and I've gotten turned around because I had a permit yesterday to go. And by the time the lead car was there after an hour and a half of us waiting, we weren't able to go because they deemed the fire unsafe, but the fire was on the road on the main road was not, so unsafe that my sister wasn't able to drive back past it and it was beyond where we even live the people manning the road don't seem to be familiar with the areas there's all this police there and they're not helping put out the fires they're just maintaining that people not leave their property it's really upsetting baria just can you clarify who was it that stopped you from going in was it police or or, i had a permit to go and so there's a roadblock set up at sorrento on the trans canada highway Mm -hmm. and that's where you get stopped and they said okay you're first in line they even let us go past the blockade and they said as soon as the pilot car gets back you will be taken to where you're going but we had to wait there's only four pilot cars and we had to wait an hour and a half for the pilot car to come and by the time it got there They said, no, we've deemed that the road is unsafe to travel on. And there was a, I believe it was a police officer was there at the the checkpoint. And there was also just like flagger people that were doing the work and the pilot car drivers. The flaggers are from the area. And, And, you know, how do we get around this? There's such a debate about being able to stay in your home, um, and look after yourself or to go away. Uh, right. But, and there's such, you know, divided opinions. Uh, how, I think how do we solve need it? to realize that competent people who are capable of doing this are the ones who want to stay. And we left because the fire, well, I, I left and my dad left and because the fire looked like it was about to come over our hillside. And so we were, you know, quite panicked and we left and we made our way to Salmon Arm. But the, it, it, it didn't come over the hillside. And because so many people stayed and were there to fight off, like my dad's house had two spot fires that almost caught it on fire, that they had to locals with trucks, fire, water tanks, you know, just on a flatbed. People we don't even know are going up and spraying down and saving our properties. So... It's not looters. There, there might be, you know, one or two people that because that seems to exist everywhere, but it, that's not what's going on. It's people that are trying to actually, I don't know why they're 
be acting in such a police state about this. Maria, I, I know that there have been some concerns, uh, and we've heard this from officials, where sometimes the fires are moving so quickly that uh, there isn't time to either learn or find out or contact people who've decided to stay behind, even yeah. if they're uh, equipped or feel as though they're equipped to, to deal with these flames. Not everybody has pumps, not everybody has hoses. And so yes. it, it may but be... The thing is, yeah. it's not moving quickly now. It did move quickly originally. Right, so that was the pinch system. point, it they felt. Left before they were even on evacuation alert. Mm. And we left because we were, we were on alert. We weren't even on an order. And that's why we left. But now that it has swept through, it's just the spot fires that are causing the... You know, and so, but anyway, I'm sorry, where are you going with what you were asking? Uh, no, I, what I wanted to ask was just what would you say to the concerns from officials who say, listen, sometimes these things are moving too fast for us to, to have to pinpoint or find people who are uh, well equipped. I would say they don't have to find people who stayed behind. People choose to stay behind because they know that they're trying to do the right thing to save their stuff. And it's like, thank you for your concern. But everybody keeps saying this is about safety. What about mental health safety and the fact that if our houses all burn down, we have nothing and nowhere to go. And, you know, it's not just safe in the moment. It's safe in your whole life. And sorry, did you say now, do you have everything you need? Do you have your medications and such? Well, I haven't been able to retrieve that particular charging cord for my Dexcom, which doesn't, you know, you can't just buy that at a pharmacy. Right. But I have... An adequate amount of what I, you know, and and so it's not like I'm about to die or anything, but the things that I would have liked to have retrieved are still in my house. And I, you know, so in terms of safety, yeah, well, that's putting me at safety, too. And for some reason, my Dexcom, which is a continuous blood sugar monitor, right. is wigging out at the moment, which isn't normally happening. So, you know, it would be nice to be able to be home and have whatever I need sent to me, obviously, they wouldn't be able to get in either. but. <laughs> and there's no word on when you may be able to return? No, not as far as I know. Aria, we really appreciate your call. Um, we're Thank glad you. that you're, you're safe and that your house is, and your family's homes are still standing. It certainly yeah. isn't the case for, for many people oh. across the province. Um, no. And so thank you for sharing um, a difficult situation with us. Um, yeah, thank you for taking my call. You're very welcome. Uh, we have more calls, and we're going to get to them right now. And Darius, we appreciate you standing by. We're going to get to the forecast in, in just a few minutes. Leslie is joining us from Vancouver. Uh, Leslie, what's your situation right now? Hi there. Um, I'm in Vancouver, and so I'm a, a long way from, from where the fires are. But I just had a an idea. I'm sure it's not original, but... Um, in you know when we're in the middle of the fires, it's chaotic and and a certain amount of chaos, and people are going to get upset. Things aren't going to go the perfectly and all of that. But in between, you know, in the winter season, when the fires are over, why doesn't the government organize and deputize people in communities across BC? who have the skills, who can, um, you know, receive training uh, in the interim, um, be part of the whole wildfire service, and, and just deputize those people, and they can stay back. They would have the identification. They would have the credentials. They would be the points of contact. Um, because the problem is that the way I am seeing it is, um, anybody can phone the wildfire service and say, look, I'm saying back, I have the skills, but how are they going to know that? It's not, you know, when I hear people say, well, people who are staying back have the skills, that's an assumption. Yeah. And it's, you know, the people who are throwing garbage at firefighters and stealing equipment and things like that, they don't necessarily have the skills they could be panicking. They could be, you know, it's, they just feel like they they can't cope with it, whatever. There are so many reasons people stay back. And it isn't necessarily because they have the skills. So mm -hmm. I'm just thinking that, you know, we know this is not a one-off thing. Every year, we're, you know, from April till September, we have this situation now. So we have to act as if this is normal. 
and we have to organize um, a way of coping with this so that we're not reacting to it. We got to deal with it on so many levels, and one of those things is is organizing within communities firefighting response, and everybody's welcome. You know, bring the whole community in in Kelowna and West Kelowna, wherever it's happening. Bring everybody in and say, okay, let's evaluate your skills. Let's see what you can contribute. Are you a medical person? Are you a firefighting person? Are you someone who can deal with, um, you know, hydro? Whatever it is, like, just have a coordinated thing. That's going to cost money. That's going to require commitment um, from everybody. And But let's get it done because we're now faced with this throughout the year even, floods, landslides everything you know and i'm sitting down here in vancouver and i'm thinking what can i do i can send money that's about all i can do but if i had some skills to contribute i would love to be able to go up and help out you know what i'm saying Mm -hmm. and i'm sure there are a lot of people uh, all over the place who would who would love to do to do this but we can't have people disobeying the authorities either we have to respect you know what they're trying to do and, but I understand the frustration people have. And if I was in that situation, I would be angry. I would be upset and, and, you know, rationally so and irrationally so. I would have it all. And I can really hear that in people that they're, you know, we have to listen to what people are saying and, and the anxiety that they have whether it's rational or not. and But I think if we can, in between the events, organize an effective way of involving the community so that they're not just passive and, you know, waiting by the phone for the evacuation alert, but, okay, it's happening, an emergency, here's my role in this. I'm not a person who can contribute. I've got to leave. I am a person who has skills. I can stay and just get that done. I'm sorry, I've gone on, but um, that's sort of how I feel about it. Leslie, thank you so much for giving us a call and sharing your thoughts. We appreciate it. And we do want to hear what you are experiencing right now. You know, is your community under evacuation order or alert? How are you holding up? You can call us at 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733, star on pound 690 on your cell phone, or email us, uh, bctoday at cbc.ca. Of course, West Kelowna has been a major focus of the wildfires in BC that have kept tens of thousands of people from the their homes. Joining us now for the latest on the situation there is Jason Brolin, the fire chief for West Kelowna. Hello, chief. Hi, good afternoon. I know you're having busy, busy days. Thank you for joining us. What's the situation in West Kelowna right now? Well, we uh, we had rain last night. Uh, it was a very small amount, but the result is, is a shift in the weather. Uh, we have higher humidity today. It was cooler overnight. So that's a positive factor for us. Uh, however, I, I've just come off a helicopter flight. And while things are, are looking promising up in the hills, there certainly still is a lot of flame, a lot of smoke, a lot of fire out there that firefighters are driving hard at today. Uh, there are multiple helicopters from the wildfire service uh, flying above. Uh, doing that aerial suppression and there are hundreds and hundreds of firefighters on the ground uh, essentially seeking and destroying hot spots here uh, in order to to try and achieve one of our primary objectives which is to try and get some people back in their homes and we know several evacuation orders have been lifted in the central okanagan chief what is being weighed to make that safe enough for west Kelowna? and we heard you earlier that there are still a lot of challenges literally stuff on the street yeah, some of these neighborhoods, there's still power poles, um, you know, laying on the side of the road. The power's been turned off, but the pole is still there smoldering. There's debris that needs to be cleaned up. There's, uh, we still have hoses, equipment, bladders out on the road uh, for water. 
Um, and they're there to protect the community should we get a run and, and get a, a wind back that might threaten it again. Uh, I can't send people back home when it's not safe and I can't do it if there's a chance I might have to pull them out again right away. Mm. Some people may not leave and, and we could be in an even more challenging situation. Mm. But we're trying and, and we are getting people home slowly, uh, bit by bit, um, people are returning. Chief, if you'll just stay with us, we're going to go to a news update now with Michelle Morton. Good afternoon. Here are the headlines from the CBC Vancouver Newsroom. Crews battling wildfires in the Okanagan say overnight rainfall has helped with mopping up fires in the area. But Environment Canada meteorologists say the rain's impact might not last long as the weather heats up this weekend. Monday is expected to be the warmest day with the temperature in Kelowna hitting 30 degrees. In the Shuswap region, Premier David Eby says he has empathy for residents trying to fight fires on their own, but says they're putting themselves at risk. Risk. Meanwhile, others on evacuation order are frustrated over a lack of help with emergency support services. EB says he's looking at ways to improve that system. The province lifted travel restrictions to most communities in southern BC except for West Kelowna. And the city of Quinell is urging residents to manage bear attractants after multiple sightings of the wild animals have been reported. The city is asking people to store garbage inside, remove fruit from trees and avoid using bird feeders until winter. And bylaw officers will be monitoring the city to ensure people get the message. The Conservation Officer Service in Prince George has destroyed 21 bears in the first three weeks of August. Now a look at the local forecast. A chance of showers this afternoon and hazy. Highs of 19 degrees and clouds are expected to clear tonight, cooling down to 13. Tomorrow, sunshine with highs of 23, except 27 degrees if you're inland. Now back to BC Today with Dan Burrett and Belle Peary. Thanks so much, Michelle. We are talking to the fire chief in West Kelowna, uh, Jason Broland. Uh, chief, thanks for staying on the line with us. Um, tell us, how can the public uh, help your department with useful information? I think what we're asking uh, from the public is, is just for patience, uh, for calm, for their understanding to know that, you know, we are at the point where we're way more confident in saying we, we got this thing we just need the time to to make it safe but you know we're also asking the public um we're receiving constant reports to 911 about fire and that's very important but if it's fire up on the hillside and the public sees smoke or a glow at night we know about those uh, we want them to continue to call us though about anything that's new or dramatic uh, that that might be spreading rapidly those are the calls we want it's things like that that's going to help us balance out the, the coming weeks that we're going to be at this fire. Chief, we have heard, and you've um, um, likely heard these sentiments as well, people who have chosen not to leave despite evacuation orders. Some saying they're staying behind to protect their property, that they're equipped to do so. They may have pumps, they may have hoses, that kind of thing. Uh, some of them are very frustrated with the with the Premier and other uh, um, um, wildfire officials and, and elsewhere. What would you say to those who have chosen to stay and feel that it's okay for them to do so, that they that they are well equipped? We go out of our way to provide advance notice of a fire as much as we can. We put evacuation orders out in order to get people out of the way. And I can tell you in our area here in West Kelowna, we, when we called for it, we had a very orderly evacuation. People listened to us. Most people left, um, and really, in our situation here, it would have been a matter of life and death for people who chose not to leave. And that's the reason why we put these out. We don't put them out because, you know, it makes our job easier or because there's some policy that says we have to. We put them out because your life is at risk. If people didn't leave some of the neighborhoods where this fire passed through, they, they surely would have been injured or, or even worse. And, you know, we, we had at least one situation where police officers and firefighters from the BC Wildfire Service put their lives at risk to take out someone who stayed and then changed their mind when things got tough. And that's what we do. We risk our lives. But when we have to do it in that situation, when there's other things we could be focusing on, it makes our job even more challenging.
Earlier today, you took time in, in your update about the fire situation to recognize the RCMP. And I'm wondering what role has the RCMP played in your efforts? They've, they've been critical for us, um, you know, right throughout this entire incident, whether it be in the beginning where you know, our evacuation order areas started small and then they moved larger and larger and larger and larger. You know, me asking them to knock on thousands of doors to tell residents that they had to leave, sometimes with, you know, smoke and fire right there. But then as we moved into the next phase of the event, you know, manning and securing roadblocks, uh, they've been key to us for patrolling neighborhoods. I mean, my neighborhood's evacuated too, and mm -hmm. I sleep easy at night because I know the police are there patrolling. It's been a tremendous team effort on the part of multiple agencies. And, and you know, I wanted to single out the RCMP today because I was told a story that the firefighters, um, you know, relayed to me. And that was that it's not just firefighters putting out fires uh, at this incident. The police and their patrols um, overnight had, had seen... A fire that uh, had had a spot fire had gotten away and threatening a home, and the police were out on the ground with a garden mm. hose, trying to keep it away from that house until we could get there and finish. And you know, there's there's just a thousand stories like that that'll never go, uh, that'll never be told about this incident. But where I'm hearing them, I'm, I'm trying to get them out and, and put credit where it's due. Absolutely a team effort. Uh, Chief, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. I know you have lots going on, so we appreciate you talking to us. You're very welcome. James Brolin is the fire chief in West Kelowna. And we have calls on the line. We've been encouraging you to call from across our province, and we appreciate it. Thanks for hanging on the line. Let's go to Bill in Terrace. Uh, Bill, what's your situation? Well, I'm, uh, I mean, my house, you know, it's not affected anything like this, but I'm so frustrated. Who's running the show here? You know, we have this social media attitude that we can do whatever we want. Our government needs to step up and say, police, fire, firefighters, first responders, these people are putting their lives on the line. Do you think they want to be standing at that roadblock choking on smoke all day and all night? Do you think they want to be patrolling those neighborhoods and having to put out spot fires and risking their life? They don't. But when, when people saying, oh, you can't tell me what to do, I'm going to stay behind, and then you put first responders' lives at risk when they have to come and get you. If I want to stay behind, I should sign a, a document stating I'm staying behind on my own accord, and I assume the risk. There's people out on boats, so planes can't pick up water. There's people pulling people off the line to go and rescue them because they can do what I want to do, and I want to do what I want to do. Our government needs to step up. If, if you refuse an order, you're either you're on your own or you get fined. If you're out in the water with your boat gawking at the fires and the, and the bombers can't pick up water, please come out there. It's a $10,000 fine. Let's step up and take control. There aren't enough people to fight the number of fires in B.C., so society's got to quit whining about it and appreciate that these people are putting their lives on the line every single moment so that hopefully your home will be protected. But if it isn't, well, guess what? It's not the police's fault. It's not the, the firefighters' fault. They did their best. I'm so frustrated with our, our online social media runs the world attitude. I love your show today. You guys are doing great. Thank you very much, Bill. Appreciate it. C can I just follow up with that, with that idea? Because, and again, one of the concerns we've heard from officials is that they don't have the time to try and suss out who or may be equipped or, or feel as though they're equipped to deal with a fire in there. So you, you, you th uh, think that there's some sort of assumption of liability that ought to take place here if you stay? Well, if I'm going to stay behind, you know, if the RCMP come to my, my farm, my, my, my farm or my, you know, my, the state of my house and say, you need to leave. And I say, no, I'm staying behind. All right, here, please sign here. You are assuming risk and responsibility and understanding that if, if things go bad, we might not be able to come and get you because we don't want to risk the lives of five people who may die trying to get you up because you wanted to stay behind. Mm -hmm. You know, they have to understand that, that the police and fire, they're on our side. These guys are putting their lives on the line. And I respect that. But we have a government that's letting society whine and complain. I can't believe people are complaining to the government that they're not doing enough. You've got to be kidding me. 400 plus fires in this province, 
We don't have enough manpower. How about the people that start the fires with the ATVs? How about tracking them down and giving them the bill? How about the guy on the lake who's stopping that water bomber from picking up water? How about giving him the bill that takes that thing to do three go-arounds and come back? How about making people responsible for delaying or, or detracting from the, the good work that needs to be done instead of agreeing with them and, and catering to them and kowtowing to them? No, this is what we're doing. This is what's best. That cop knows you can't go past that, that checkpoint because it's too dangerous. He knows that. I don't care if you live there or not. He's protecting you because you're choosing not to. I respect that cop. And then he gets abused because he's doing his job to protect you? Not a chance. I can't, thank, I can't do that. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, Bill. We appreciate the call. We're going to go to West Kelowna now, and Bob is on the line. Yes? No? Uh, hello? Hi, Bob. Hello. Uh, what are your thoughts? You're in West Kelowna, are you? Yeah, I am, but uh, I have uh, no bone to pick with the, the uh, authorities in West Kelowna. They handled it as uh, as well as it could be handled. What I wish to speak to is the uh, the situation up in the Shoe Swamp, where um, uh, the the uh, authorities, the RCMP, were preventing. Um, a fellow who decided to stay and fight the fire, they were preventing him from being supplied in his efforts. Um, if a man decides to risk his life to protect his home from the wildfire, it's not okay for the civil authorities to intervene with his efforts and to block the efforts of his friends to support him. You know, he was way the heck and gone away from anybody who was ever going to be able to help him. So I would suggest he had the right to do for himself what the authorities could not do. They couldn't protect his home, and it's absolutely ridiculous that that they should try and prevent him for, for, from protecting his home. And what's your situation? Did you have to leave your home? No. No, I was all uh, all loaded up and ready to go, but the evacuation zone never expanded to cover me. Bob, we put these concerns to, to West Kelowna Fire Chief Jason Proland. Hopefully you were able to hear that. He said that they had a situation where somebody chose to stay. The mm-hmm. fire got really bad, really close. The person had to change their mind, essentially, and authorities had to go in and get them out, risking their lives. What about those situations? In those situations where the local authorities have the resources on hand to fight the fire, he should best pack his gear and get out of there. It's a matter of balance. You know, I'm not defending the right of somebody who wants to sit in his home in West Kelowna and... and not obey the evacuation order but i'm concerned about the gentleman who lived on uh, i believe the north so- side of uh, shushwap lake mm-hmm. and uh, there were no uh, firefighters of any stripe available to help him if he evacuated as they wanted him to his home would have burned to the ground and I think that the consequences of evacuating um, were devastating, whereas the consequences of not evacuating um, were, uh, like for the, the, the civil authorities, he did their job for them. They were not in a position to do it, and he did their job for them. He saved his own home. He saved the homes of his neighbors. And frankly, he has the right to do for himself what the local authorities didn't have the capacity to do. Um, And it would be absolutely ridiculous to suggest that he flee and allow the fire to consume, consume his home. He has the right to do for himself what the local authorities 
didn't have the capacity to do. Bob, we, West we, Colo- yeah, sorry, go ahead. In West Kelowna, the people on the ground, the firefighters, had the equipment and the skills to fight the fire. And in that case, the citizens uh, who have been asked to evacuate should pack their gear and get the hell out of the way. But in this case, on balance, um, I think that he did the right thing. You know, mm-hmm. why don't the authorities write him a ticket and, and let, the, let it go to court and the judge will throw it out of court? You know, mm-hmm. he was doing um, his civic duty. He depend, defended his home and the home of, homes of his neighbors. Mm-hmm. Bob, we appreciate your call. Thank you very much for for joining us and and sharing your perspective. Certainly there is a wide range of views on this. And in various situations, uh, you don't know what's going through somebody's mind when their life may be at stake, but their livelihood, their home, their businesses, um, very challenging overall. We're going to switch gears for just a second. We have uh, several calls on the line. Please stay with us. We will get to you as soon as we can. And apologies if you hear some rustling and banging of microphones. There's a lot of paper flying around as we do a live three-hour show uh, on TV and video and on radio. And we appreciate you being here. Uh, We we know the effects of wildfires on our physical and mental well-being. What about wildlife, though? Well, fires ripping through forest and grassland has had a big impact on them as well. Our guest for this segment can answer your questions about how the fires are impacting wild animals and what we can do to help. Give us a call on this, 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733, uh, pound 690 on your cell phone, and you can email BC Today at cbc.ca. Joining us now is Karen Hodges, University of BC Okanagan Biology Professor. Uh, Most of BC's current fires are located in the interior. And uh, Karen, we're wondering what kinds of wildlife are affected there? Hi, thank you for having me. Any species that lives in a forest is affected right now. So we are talking several hundred different birds, including owls, hawks, chickadees, all sorts of small birds. We're talking mountain lions, um, coyotes, snowshoe hares, red squirrels, all of the animals that you would think about that make BC such a great place to recreate are going to be affected by these wildfires. And are trying to escape them. Yes. So we know that animals (laughs) also hate fires. Um, So many of them will be uh, fleeing in one way or another. Some will end up dying in these fires that they just couldn't get away in time or they die of smoke inhalation. And we also need to think about how long term these consequences are going to be. Mature forest takes decades to grow. Mm -hmm. And so when we lose mature forest, that's going to be really poor quality habitat for these animals for a long time. So it, it's both the immediate problem of, you know, a really bad week of, of flames and smoke, but then also these, these much longer term consequences. So to that end, you know, what is the scope of the damage to habitats? Perhaps what we've learned from previous fire seasons or what we might know already about what's been happening over the last few weeks? Right. So... It's a bleak picture. There are a number of forest stands that have burned that are just not regenerating to forest, that the conditions now are too hot or too dry or not enough seeds or another fire reburns before the trees get to be mature. So some models actually estimate that between 15 and 50% of the forest in British Columbia could be lost in the next century because of this problem of of fire and then lack of regeneration. So that's massive. When we think about the the number of animals that would live in those forests and then converting that permanently to something else, we are living in a moment of really fragile time for a number of species. I think that's I, that's a number I have not heard before, Karen. That's that's rather stunning. Uh, Of that percentage, and we talked about this with other um, uh, um, experts in this field, 
we've heard about the importance of biodiversity and, and increasing uh, the variety of, 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 I guess, fire resistant, drought resistant plants. Maybe it's not all just boreal forest, but, but more deciduous, that kind of thing. What sort of mix do we need and can it be generated post fire? I don't think we're going to engineer our way out of this problem. And so what you're talking about, you know, can we just plant the right things in the right places and that will reduce fire and create this great biodiversity landscape? I don't think we will be able to do that. The, the scale of what we're talking about is so big and climate change is accelerating, right? So it's not like, okay, you know, now we're at a new normal and, and the next two decades are gonna be like the last five years, which have been awful by the way, you know, fire after fire and all the hurricanes and the heat domes and so on, all of the climate change forecasts suggest it's going to worsen instead of be stable at this point. So even if we figured out, you know, let's plant more drought resistant plants somewhere, uh, we're just gonna be nibbling at the edges of this problem. We're not going to catch up to it. So what we need to do is get a handle on climate change. And, you know, we talked about, you said a lot of wildlife will be injured, lot will not survive. Um, but wildlife that does manage to escape the flames and the smoke, um, I would assume coming down from the hills into more urban areas, uh, you know, what happens to that wildlife after they've made the initial escape? Yeah, that's a great question. We don't have a ton of research on that because trying to you know figure out where the animals were living and then where do they go and how do they survive that that's actually surprisingly complicated to do as a scientist anecdotally there's a fair bit of evidence exactly as you suggest that they're displaced so if they had a home range or a territory that burned obviously they can't live there so they move into new locations i was talking with a friend this morning who said after the 2003 fires she had friends of hers, you know, in houses that, that survived the fires that were just inundated by mice over the next year. And, you know, that the thinking is that these animals just are looking for anything, even if it's not great, because they, they no longer have the homes that they, they had before the fires. I do expect a lot of mortality and failed reproduction in the, the summer next year of these displaced animals that it's going to be a long, hard, hungry winter and that many of them just won't be able to find a place to breed or be in enough physical condition to breed. Karen, in that case, are species, do you expect to see different species move to different areas and, and try and permanently carve out a, a, or eke out a new living? So in terms of switching habitats, not really. So I'm thinking of things like Canada lynx and snowshoe hare and red squirrel that really do need mature forest and or at least, you know, late stage sapling dense tree cover. They can't suddenly become grassland animals. You know, they might be able to walk across it to try to find a new forest, but they won't be able to just suddenly switch what they do. I do expect animals fleeing the fires to try to find the best possible, what can I get to that resembles what I like, but it may well be poorer. And they are, of course, moving into home ranges of other animals. And so, you know, it, it's, 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 it's tough on them. They've lost their homes and they have to move elsewhere and it's not going to be a pretty journey for them. Karen, thank you for talking to us today. It's my pleasure, thank you. Karen Hodges is with the University of BC Okanagan. She's a biology professor. We're gonna to go to some more calls now. We appreciate it, we're just heading up to a news break and right after that, we'll bring you the update from the BC Wildfire Service and the provincial government. We'll take that live. Jan is joining us in Langford. Uh, Jan, what do you make of what's happening right now? Yeah, hi there, I'll just get you off my speakerphone. So I'm really upset with the way uh, our government and the, and the wildlife and our police too, our national police force, RCMP, treating uh, private uh, homeowners. Mm -hmm. I've had two landlords over the last 40 years. I'm 61. I'm industrial firefighting trained. I worked for CIL. I was in the emergency response team back in uh, the 80s and 90s. Um, I've had um, 
uh, landlords who were volunteers, uh, young and old. Uh, one guy was in his early 30s, another one was in his uh, late early 70s. Uh, and and to to um, to uh, uh, you know cut off supplies to to private homeowners fighting to defend their 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 homes is absolutely outrageous. Uh, and I think this government's got to think through uh, what it's doing, and it's got to think about. Maybe going on a war footing um, with like World War II, for example, and you work with the citizens. You have fire brigades. You've got a fire watch, uh, and um, you you know, uh, and especially with our First Nations people, our First Nations people aren't going to abandon their their homes. You know, so I think there needs to be uh, 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 some kind of coordinated effort starting now, uh, not waiting until a, a year or two or after the next election. Forget that crap. We need to do something now. That's how I feel about it. And, and Jan, if that was the case, if there was a system set up to have experienced people like you and others uh, 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 sign up or have a job, if not on the front lines, but in logistics or some other role, uh, would you would you sign up? Of course I would. Yeah. I mean, i got a retired Navy friend of mine. He's in the emergency management here in B.C. on, on the South Island. So there's all kinds of people who would love to get involved, and, and, and we need to start training uh, our, our, our civilians. And this is a war footing. Uh, and this is, we're, we're having a war uh, on climate change, and it's going to destroy B.C. if we don't get our act together. Yeah, and we appreciate the call. Thank you yeah, very thank you. much. Um, again, one of the, the several calls we had yesterday and into today from people who have had some experience with uh, firefighting, either logistics or frontline, and, and want to get involved. And perhaps uh, if government officials are listening, that this is an idea that they can um, take up and see what they can do. Let's go to Chris in Kelowna just before the news break. Uh, Chris, we're a bit squeezed for time, but go ahead. What's your situation? My situation is pretty clear. We're... Uh Living in an RV. Having a little trouble hearing you, Chris. So let's try that one more time. Okay. Is that any better? Yep, much better. Okay. So, uh, yeah, my situation is really good. Luckily, we're not living on our property where we're trying to build on West Side Road. If we were two lots over, we would uh, that property would have been under evacuation. So, on that regards, we're doing well. Thank you. But mm -hmm. my comments are mirroring a lot of um, what previous callers are saying about coordinating with everyone and utilizing what we can. Uh, so my experiences with forest fires is not only did I work at the Vernon Airport 30 years ago when we did fire patrol, Rob Dickin and Richard Rotondo, that was interesting. But my father, 40 years ago, worked for the forestry and was in charge of, he had $12 million at his disposal to go fight forest fires. He would go and get excavators, airplanes, and if you didn't give them up, you go to jail. He would go to the bar at 1 o'clock in the morning, and any able-bodied man was out fighting forest fires with him. They were putting out multiple hundred thousand hectare fires in a few days, and quite successful, apparently, from, from, from what I remember. So if we could get back to something like that, um, just like a couple of years ago when Buff Lumber with the Westfold and Monte Lake fires had it pretty much under control, and due to liability issues, were forced to evacuate. And they could have really utilized all that equipment, all that personnel, the knowledge. Even myself, I have fire suppression courses. And when I am on my property next year in the West Shore Estates, I am going to be building a house that's relatively fireproof. It will be doing steel roofs, irrigation, escape route, um, safe room, whole nine yards. Right. So... As to your previous two, uh, caller from two, two or three calls ago, him saying he made some excellent points. There was a guy before Bob. You've got to trust the police and, and the fire, and that if they, that cop says it's too dangerous to go past there, you got to listen to him. Well, Chris, we, yeah. we hate, hate to cut you off. We're just heading up to the news. We really appreciate you, you calling in. We're glad you're safe. We're going to get to the news uh, with Michelle Morton at the bottom of the hour, or top of the hour, I should say. And right after that, an update from the province. This is CBC News from Vancouver. Good afternoon, I'm Michelle Morton. In the North Shoe Swap, the Bush Creek East Wildfire is now the priority for the BC Wildfire Service. That blaze now covers more than 410 square kilometres. Here's Information Officer Forrest Tower. Definitely a very large response to this fire. Right now, that the Bush Creek East Fire is top of the list in terms of um, getting resources and, uh, and and how we have how we prioritize all fires in the province. So 
lots of resources out there, more incoming in terms of wildland firefighting. It's not clear how many homes have been lost since the two fires on either side of Adams Lake merged Friday night. He says there's been no major growth since then, thanks in large part to cooler weather overnight. Temperatures in the Okanagan are about to heat up. It's bad news for the firefight after several days of cooler weather. The area did not did get some precipitation overnight, but Environment Canada meteorologist Armel Castellan says the rain was not enough to have a long-lasting impact on drought conditions. Environment Canada is forecasting temperatures closer to seasonal norms in the Okanagan by the end of the week. Monday, it's expected to be the hottest day with Kelowna forecast to reach 30 degrees. The wildfires burning in Greece could get from bad to worse as wind in the forecast threatens to fan the flames. Flames, rather, more than 200 new fires were sparked just this week. It comes as Greece and much of Europe confront yet another sweltering heat wave. A firefighting helicopter takes another run at the flames which are getting ever closer to Athens. This is one of more than 350 wildfires currently burning across Greece. This particular fire began yesterday in the foothills of Mount Parnitha, about 20 kilometres to the north of the capital. It's left a trail of destruction in its path, burning homes and cars and forcing residents to flee on foot. It's a similar scene in the northeastern region of Evros, where fires have been burning out of control for five days now. It was here that the burned bodies of 18 people, believed to be migrants, were found yesterday. Their deaths making up the majority of the 20 people who've been killed so far as a result of these fires. Dominic Valaitis, CBC News, London. Officials in Russia are working to identify remains of several air crash victims. It is believed the infamous boss of the Wagner mercenary group is among them. Chris Brown has the latest. Video shot from the ground shows the Embraer business jet apparently already on fire, spinning into the ground and exploding in a ball of flames. And while Russian news sources say mercenary leader Evgeny Prigozhin was on the passenger list, there is no evidence yet he was among the 10 dead. But it wouldn't be a surprise. Prigozhin appeared to be a man living on borrowed time since his failed mutiny in June. It humiliated President Vladimir Putin and embarrassed Russia's defense ministry. The apparent truce afterward that appeared to let him travel to and from Russia was a surprise given the ruthlessness with which Putin has eliminated other rivals in the past. Whether it was a missile or something else that brought it down, there was reportedly a second prigozhin owned jet in the air nearby, so the questions will now focus on who precisely was on each plane. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. India has landed a lunar probe on the surface of the moon. India is on the moon. That's the mission control celebration from India's space agency as an Indian lunar probe successfully touched down today on the moon's south pole. A Russian attempt to land in the same region recently ended in failure. For India, it's the country's first trip to the moon. They joined the United States, the Soviet Union and China as the only nations to pull off the accomplishment. And the south pole landing is a scientific first. No country has explored this area. Scientists believe craters in the region may continue contain frozen water. Back in B.C., the city of Quinell is urging residents to manage bear attractants. Officials say multiple bear sightings have been reported in and around the community. The city is asking people to store garbage inside, remove fruit from trees, and avoid using bird feeders until winter. Quinell bylaw officers will be monitoring the city to ensure people get the message. The Conservation Officer Service in Prince George has destroyed 21 bears in the first three weeks of August. And that's the CBC News from Vancouver. Vancouver. For news anytime, go to cbc.ca slash bc or use the CBC News app. Now taking a look at your local weather from Environment Canada. A chance of showers this afternoon and hazy, highs of 19 degrees. Those clouds are expected to clear this evening and cool down to 13. Tomorrow, sunshine, highs of 23 except 27 inland and clear in the evening with a low of 15. On Friday, a mix of sun and clouds with a chance of showers, highs of 23 except 26 inland and cloudy periods in the evening with a low of 15. Now back to BC Today with Dan Burrett and Belle Peary.
Thanks so much, Michelle, and welcome to this extended edition of BC Today. Now, we're going to take you as soon as we can live to an update from the BC Wildfire Service and uh, provincial officials as well. So we're just waiting for that to get started. The Lytton First Nations evacuation order was expanded to eight additional reserves. 30 to 40 people were having to evacuate their homes last night. Now, I'm told we can go uh, to the BC Wildfire fire service uh, news conference right now. See personnel, leadership, firefighters and volunteers in Tecumlups to Sewetmec, Kelowna, West Kelowna. And I stand with a deep and heavy heart, deeply aware of the pain and hardship that so many people are facing in this region. Homes that held cherished memories Treasured possessions and a sense of security have been lost. Others are still waiting for news. I understand that no words can truly encapsulate the emotions that many of you are feeling. People are in shock and disbelief and are enduring an overwhelming sense of grief and loss. The stories are devastating, but also show the strength of British Columbians. I know of volunteers in West Kelowna and Kelowna who continued to provide support services to their neighbors and communities, even while they themselves were on evacuation order and waiting to hear if their homes have survived. It is that determination and resolve that will get us through these incredibly challenging times together. As of this morning, more than 25,000 people are on evacuation order and 37,000 people are on evacuation alert. That is 25,000 people who have been forced out of their home due to wildfire and 37,000 more people who must be prepared to leave their homes at a moment's notice. As I shared yesterday, the emergency order that we put in place on Saturday restricting travel to a number of communities in the Okanagan has had the effect that we required. Thousands of hotel rooms were made available for people who were forced from their homes as well as the many firefighters and emergency crews that required housing. I want to express my deepest gratitude to everyone who canceled their plans to travel, as well as to our partners in the tourism industry for their support and for their understanding. Because the desired effect has been achieved, we have lifted travel restrictions for the purposes of staying in temporary accommodation in Kelowna, Kamloops, Oliver, Asoyus, Penticton, and Vernon effective today. However, the order does remain in West Kelowna. Working with our local government and First Nation partners, we continue to place in people into the accommodations that are now available. And we are also block booking additional available rooms in the event that they are needed. I know that many communities in the interior are looking forward to welcoming, responsibly recreating tourists again. But I ask that the traveling public continue to be thoughtful about where they go. In addition to West Kelowna, some heavily impacted communities like Lake Country and the Shushwap are indicating that now is not the time to visit them. Please respect their wishes. Know before you go and be prepared. Have emergency provisions with you and monitor information on the BC Wildfire Service website, Emergency Info BC and Drive BC. There is a tremendous effort underway to ensure that everyone who needs emergency support services has access to them, given the extremely large number of evacuees. I want to deeply thank our local partners, local governments, regional districts, and First Nations for the role that they play in managing the on-the-ground operations of these reception centres. At the same time, I know that some people have had to endure wait times at reception centres. These are some of the most stressful moments of a people's life. And having to wait at reception centers or wait for help adds to that stress. I want to recognize people's frustration and thank them for their patience as volunteers diligently navigate through this monumental task. We continue to take action, working with the local governments to see, speed up processing times and get to everyone including by engaging the Service BC call centre to provide support and initiating immediate transfer of evacuees from the queue into suitable lodging. The more than 10,000 people registered for emergency support services in relation to the McDougal Creek fire alone, either through a reception centre or through our online system, 
are being supported by 13 in-person and virtual reception centres around the province. And as of this morning, everyone in our system, in Lake Country, West Kelowna, Kelowna, West Bank and West Bank First Nation, has been contacted one way or another. Accommodation in hotels is available, so if someone out there is having difficulty getting through and still needs accommodation, please call 1-800-387-4258. Our service providers are working around the clock to ensure that everyone has access to the support that they need. And I urge everyone in fire-affected areas to proactively pre-register with emergency support services online at ess.gov. .bc.ca. Over the last several days, the situation has stabilized in some areas. However, it could change and there are other areas that remain very active. For example, last night Lytton First Nation issued evacuation orders as a result of the Kukukipi Creek wildfire. I want to acknowledge the stress that that causes for a community, especially a community like Lytton First Nation who has already been through so much. It's a reminder that we must be agile in case our circumstances change. While we have been lucky to receive some rain in some places, we are still in a hazardous situation for wildfires throughout British Columbia. And we will continue to assess the situation, work with local governments and First Nations and adapt our responses needed. I recognize that it is an, a remarkably difficult time for people under an evacuation order. It is difficult to leave behind your home and everything that you love. But evacuation orders must be followed. They are not suggestions, they are the law. When unauthorized people are in evacuation areas, it escalates the danger involved for everyone. It also limits the kind of wildfire fighting tactics that the BC Wildfire Service can deploy and it redirects critical resources away from the wildfire fight itself into searching for moving equipment, moved equipment, redoing work that's already been done to set up structural protection, or just trying to manage an unpredictable situation made even more unpredictable by well-meaning but uncoordinated firefighting efforts. I know that some people want to stay and fight. I understand that but it is also my duty to be clear about the risks to people and emergency crews. This has become an increasingly divisive issue within the community and outside. And let me be clear, our collective fight is with the wildfire. But in order to do this, our efforts need to be united. We need to work together, not against each other. BC Wildfire Service personnel are actively working to open up a dialogue with those behind the lines who are refusing to leave to try to create an understanding of the seriousness of the situation. And as they've done in the past, in other communities, BC Wildfire Service is reaching out proactive... And as they've done in the past, in other communities, the BC Wildfire Service is reaching out to skilled, experienced people in the shoe shop to try and incorporate them into their work. We have to be working together on this, though. People can't be doing their own thing. We can't have equipment that's been staged for firefighters being moved, so it's not there when it's needed. That puts the whole unified strategy at risk, and it puts people and their homes at risk. We have a shared challenge we're trying to fight, and that is the wildfire, and we fight it by working together. But I want to be clear that we're talking about skilled, experienced people in this case. My message to British Columbians is that evacuation orders must be followed. Fires are unpredictable, and they move fast. Areas under evacuation order are not safe places, and when you are asked to leave, you must leave immediately. I also want to assure, reassure people in the North Shushwap that supplies are being delivered. Deliveries of food and fuel have been made to Magna Bay, Anglemont, and Seymour Arm. As part of an advanced planning effort, we secured and, and graded a 
Forest Service Road to ensure that people had access in and out of their community in event of an evacuation order. And we are organizing piloted trips through the back road to support people getting to where they need to go. And waterways are also being used when they are safe to do so in coordination with emergency management personnel. Right now, a lot of British Columbians have been asking how they can help. And I've seen firsthand the remarkable outpouring of support from food banks, community organizations, and non-governmental organizations. The Canadian Red Cross and the United Way British Columbia are among several organizations that have joined this effort. While much appreciated, the donation of items like furniture, clothing, and other, I guess, yeah, I'll just say that again because, pardon me, give me a second. <clears throat> been talking a lot over the last few days. Thank you for your patience. While much appreciated, the donation of items like clothing and furniture can be a logistical challenge for teams that are already under immense pressure to take care of people. If you would like to help, I'm asking you to make a monetary donation to trusted organizations such as the United Way of British Columbia, Canadian Red Cross, BC SPCA, or Food Banks BC. I want to thank you again to everyone who canceled their plans over the last several days. Your help made a monumental difference in our ability to ensure that people who were evacuated and, first res and emergency responders had a place to stay. I also want to give a huge thank you to all search and rescue volunteers who have been assisting with evacuations. We are all in this together. We will continue to get through this together. Continue to please stay calm, be alert, and be prepared. Thank you so much. I'd like to turn it over to Minister Rossman. Uh, th thanks very much, uh, Minister Ma. Good afternoon. I'm Bruce Ralston, Minister of Forests. Uh, I'm honored to be here on the territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slave Tooth people. Uh, as Minister uh, Ma, you heard her describe, yesterday was an emotionally moving day. It was an opportunity to see firsthand the devastation that has impacted people and communities, as well as the landscape. I also want to acknowledge I'm very well aware that this has been people's reality for the last week, that everyone impacted with this 24-7, and what we witnessed is merely a snapshot of what life has been for people and families for some time. In speaking with people at evacuation centers, their stories were harrowing, but also inspiring. I spoke with a, a man who had a, has a tourism business that involves uh, taking people out on, on boats on the lake. Uh, his business is uh, in abeyance at the moment, but he was there as a volunteer in the Kelowna Emergency Response Center, trying to help out, notwithstanding his own uh, personal troubles. And I also uh, chatted with uh, the fire chief of uh, West Kelowna, uh, who uh, has uh, re recounted his story, but in a very uh, modest and I would say almost uh, stereotypical Canadian way, he said really it was, it was all about the other people, the four or five people that supported him and worked with him and discounted any claim to being a, a hero. And I thought that was particularly inspiring. So we also met with uh, emergency personnel, leadership, uh, firefighters, and volunteers to thank them for their incredible ongoing efforts. Let me uh, offer my thanks as well, my sincere gratitude and appreciation to everyone who has worked so diligently, so such long hours to help keep people safe, and express once again my support for the remarkable work that everyone at the BC Wildfire Service is doing uh, and that's the full team, those in the field, but also those in the centers who support those in the field. They work uh, the same hours and every bit as hard, along with Indigenous firefighters, contractors, and municipal firefighters. I think we can all understand and appreciate just how dangerous and demanding firefighting is, and we understand the sacrifices uh, you're making. We're confident that you're giving it everything you've got. And I'm also so relieved and thankful to hear that, as of yet, uh, no lives have been reported lost in the central Okanagan fires. Protecting people 
is always our first priority. There are currently 376 wildfires burning across British Columbia. 14 of those are fires of note. We continue to keep our fire resourcing as high as possible in those affected areas. And I have been meeting with people to talk our way through the response on the ground. We now have more than 3,500 personnel directly engaged in wildfire responses across the province. I, also, I want to emphasize that these are the crews who are working on the landscape, on the fire line, and may not be readily, readily visible to people in communities. But they are taking the actions necessary, needed on the fire, to keep people and communities safe. They have been joined uh, recently uh, by 652 firefighters from 108 municipal fire departments from around British Columbia. And that is a really impressive collective effort uh, on the part of those departments who are providing additional support in structural defense, that's uh, buildings. Today we also welcome 100 additional Mexican firefighters who will arrive in British Columbia. And in the following days, South African and Australian personnel will arrive to assist in local firefighting efforts. Thankfully, yesterday we saw Tropical Storm Hillary bring a bit of much needed rain to some parts of British Columbia, which, mean, which means more favorable conditions for firefighting. In the southern interior, the coming days are also like, more likely to see more rain and cooler temperatures. While it's not as much as uh, rain as we want, I know that our crews in these areas are preparing to take advantage of every bit of rain we can. Wildfire smoke conditions and visibility has significantly improved over the past 24 hours at the gross complex of fires, wildfires in the Okanagan Valley. Air operations are resuming in the fire area after playing a, a limited role due to poor visibility uh, in recent days. If it's very, very smoky, planes can't fly. There are presently 17 helicopters assigned to bucketing and fire management at the McDougall Creek wildfire at West Kelowna the Walroy Lake fire, wildfire and the Clark Creek wildfire. Crews are also eager to resume air operations and other fires as soon as conditions allow. With this, I must also want to remind people once again to allow these helicopters the room they need to do their work. Drones are a significant hazard to our fire crews who are fighting fires, and it is illegal to fly them in fire areas. Finally, while well, some of the fires we've been talking about have been more stable in recent days, we still have some very active fires in British Columbia near communities. I, I want to echo Minister Ma's comments about the Kukipi Creek fire near Boston Bar. An incident management team has taken uh, command of that wildfire as of Monday. Unfortunately, the rain, the, the rain that some parts of British Columbia are, are seeing didn't come into the Fraser Canyon and it is still very active uh, further north. Crews continue to work hard to protect vital infrastructure, including transmission lines, railways, and Highway 1, along with working to limit growth on the south and eastern portions of the fire. So while the shift in weather will hopefully give our wildfire fighters and, fire, uh, and firefighters in the southern interior a bit of a reprieve, we still ask everyone throughout British Columbia to remain prepared. Despite the fact that wildfire has dominated much of our attention in the last week, we are still experiencing a very serious drought. And so much of the landscape is still very, very dry, leaving many parts of the province at risk of fires. I'm also urging everyone to continue to check on road closures from on the Drive BC app and report wildfires using the BC Wildfire Service or by calling star 5555 from a cell phone. This information that you provide may be critical to BC Wildfire Service operations. Uh, your, your response in reporting a fire may be the first indication that uh, the service has of the fire and, and we're able to respond just that much faster because you have taken the effort to re report it. So thank you when you do that. Um, thank you. I'll now turn it back to uh, Minister Moore. Thank you so much. 
Um, we will now be able to take some questions. In addition to Mr. Ralston and myself, we have Cliff Chapman, Director of BC Wildfire Service or Director of Wildfire Operations with BC Wildfire Service, Peter Brock, Executive Director of Regional Operations with uh, Emergency Management Climate Readiness, as well as Chrissy Oliver, Executive Director of Provincial Response Programs of EMCR on the line to answer questions. We are now open. We are now open for the questions. For media in the room, please line up at the microphone. I believe we don't have any media questions in the room. And um, for anyone online, remember to use star one to get on the queue. And please make sure to provide your full name and outlet. Media will be limited to one question and one follow up. We have Mara Baines from CBC. Thank you. This question is for Minister Ma. In terms of trying to work with some of the folks out there in the shoe shop to fight fires, how is how are you going to open those lines of communication? Given that there's there's just uh, just so much frustration out there, and also, will there be any compensation offered to those folks if they work together with provincial firefighters? Uh, back in 2015, in Rock Creek, uh, the province compensated a group of residents who. who fought fires to protect their own property. So, um, you know, just wondering about how, to, how you're going to open those lines of communication and also if some of these people in the shoe shop will be offered compensation as well. Okay. I'll, I'll start off on the question. I'll give uh, Minister Ralston a chance to see if he has anything to add and we'll also check in with Cliff Chapman on it as well. First off, the BC Wildfire Service does already willingly work with contractors right across the province. Um, we have support staff, we have um, contractors from all sorts of industries that come with equipment, with training, with its experience. The key here is that those wildfire fighting efforts have to be be coordinated under the unified command. BC Wildfire Service works with meteorologists and, um, and experts to project what is happening um, on the wildfire and where it will go, where the defense lines need to be set up, uh, what critical structures need to be protected at any given time, and they have a plan. And part of the challenge of having uh, people who are, a, uh, who I believe are trying to do uh, good things but are uncoordinated with a centralized effort is that they can disrupt that plan, um, cause wildfire fighters uh, the need to go searching for equipment that they've staged, um, go uh, redo work that they've already done before. It also reduces the kind of tactics that the BC Wildfire Service can actively implement in those areas. Uh, for example, the BC Wildfire Service cannot use a direct aircraft attack or use aircraft to do a direct attack on wildfires if they know that there are civilians in the area. They also cannot execute uh, uh, backburns uh, if they know that there are people who are in those areas that they are attempting to, to backburn. So it is incredibly important that these efforts be coordinated and they already do work with contractors and, um, and yeah, additional like people uh, all over. Um, and when they do use and work with these contractors, they are compensated for that work. But it has to be done under the unified command. The Minister Ma has covered uh, very important points. I, I would say just my experience in being briefed by the BC Wildfire Service is that in any fire uh, action, uh, there's a lot of planning that goes into that. And much of that is not visible and I uh, was not aware of that myself until I uh, was given these briefs. Um, so planning, pre-planning is very important and in order to uh, be sure that, um, that civilians are not impacted, uh, they need to be out of the area. So uh, BC Wildfire Service works proactively to reach out to people with skills, with equipment uh, to join the effort, but it's very important that that be part of a unified team approach in order that the firefighting can be the most effective uh, it can, uh, it should be and will be. So, so that, that effort is, is really important. I don't know, Cliff may, uh, as the Director of Operations, may have some further comments. 
Thank you, Minister Ma and Minister Ralston. Uh, I, I agree with, with what you guys have said. I, I just want to highlight uh, an example on the same complex, and we have had great success working in the Nutsford community just outside of Kamloops and bringing in some of the locals in and around that area to support us on the Rossmore Lake fire. And so this isn't something new. It's it, I, I want to echo what Minister Ma said is we do want to ensure from a safety perspective and from uh, the tactics that we have on the ground that we are working in a unified way. Uh, and so those are the conversations that we started last night. We're going to continue today to see if we can come to an understanding of what that's going to look like to work together to try to protect the areas in the North Shushwap and beyond as that fire continues to move forward. So we are interested in this conversation of, of working together. But again, I want to stress it's, it has to be done in a safe and coordinated way. And we have seen examples of that in BC over the years. And, and in, even this year with the Nutsford example, we had the community of Southside really step into the response effort uh, in 2018. And we continue to open up this opportunity for communities to work with us uh, as we work to protect communities, infrastructure, and, and really you know, get that fire outside of the area where it has the threat to the community. The area where it has the threat to the community. Next question, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, I do. Um, so my second question is around communications in the shoe shop. Uh, residents there say the evacuation notices from the district came too late that the fire was already approaching very quickly. Is there any thought to helping regional districts that don't have a lot of resources so they can get the word out in a more timely way? Um, is, there, is there a possibility of maybe a more unified provincial kind of system um, or, or, help, or helping smaller regional districts with communications during uh, a time that they're under wildfire threat? Yeah, absolutely. EMCR and BC Wildfire Service, uh, all of our emergency management partners, we work very closely with the local government to uh, support them in all of their needs, including communication needs as well. Uh, for instance, local governments, regional districts, and First Nations can uh, request that a broadcast intrusive alert be sent out on their behalf. Um, so that's the the BI alerts are the ones that uh, get sent directly to your cell phones, to uh, the radio, to television. Um, that being said, every community is different. And in many of these remote areas, cell phone reception is spotty. Uh, it is something obviously that, uh, is, that our government is working on with our connectivity work to try to connect. Uh, the, all of BC with high-speed internet and cell phone service and so forth, but it is that work is incomplete. And so there are some areas where a connection is spotty and a BI intrusive alert might not be the best way. And in those cases where um, action has to be taken very quickly in terms of evacuations, uh, RCMP, search and rescue volunteers, and other responders were, will physically go door to door to evacuate people. Uh, with that, maybe... I'm just going to check to see if Cliff or Peter have anything else that they wanted to offer on that. Next week, next, next week, next we have Keith Baldry from Global News. Thank you very much. I think it's a, a question for Minister Ralston. The 20, the 2003 post wildfire review report. I think it was by George Abbott after the colonial wildfires about 20 years ago highlighted thousands of square kilometers that needed wildfire fuel clearing before the season began but experts say only a small percentage of that has been done over the years can you talk about how much was done before this season and was enough done uh, and why more uh, wildfire risk reduction treatments weren't accomplished in the last number of years uh, thanks very much. Uh, the 2003 report, I think, if memory serves me correctly, was done by former Premier Gary Philman from Manitoba. Um, yes, there is a, a very uh, well-developed program, FireSmart, in some uh, parts of the province. It's been taken up uh, very substantially. Um, what that involves is basically work to remove the f fuel, potential fuel, from a fire in what are called the jargon term is interface areas. That, that's where houses and subdivisions and buildings join the forest, and that's 
the areas that are typically most at risk. So the idea is to, uh, in advance, uh, pay uh, for crews to remove that. It, it can be on public land and on private land. Those programs are well developed. The uptake has probably not been what we looked for. Uh, although we did hear uh, earlier in the season about the, the Mount uh, 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 Knox fire in, uh, in Kelowna, the uh, chief administrative officer uh, of Kelowna complimented uh, uh, our department, the D Ministry of Forestry, on the impact that the FireSmart program had had in removing fuel, and he said it was a significant factor in being able to bring that fire under control very quickly. Uh, I expect that this will be uh, the subject of discussion at the Union of BC Municipalities uh, Convention in a couple of weeks, uh, and uh, encouragement will be given to municipalities. The funding is there. It just simply, I think, hasn't been taken up. I think people sometimes think that these are, these are not essential programs. These are make-work programs. They're the very opposite of that. They can be the difference between successfully extinguishing a fire and seeing a fire go on to profoundly damage a community. So uh, we are uh, strong proponents, I know Minister Ma is as well, uh, of, of the FireSmart program, uh, and uh, we expect to see uh, and encourage uh, a significant uptake of the program beyond what we've seen already. And as I say, I want to compliment those uh, landowners, those uh, cities that have uh, participated and encourage others to, given the results that are possible uh, in terms of prevention, take up the program as well. Thank you. Do you have any follow-ups? Yes, sir. thanks for the correction, Minister. That you're right, it was Gary Fillman, not George Evans, he came later. <laughs> Further to that line of questioning, uh, given that climate change has sort of changed the face of wildfires, uh, every year they're becoming more awful, or at least consuming more acre hectares. Uh, they're more ferocious, it seems, and they're occurring sometimes in places we don't normally associate with wildfires. Given that, is there any thought to expanding this sort of fire smart program to communities that don't normally associate with wildfires? And by that, I'm talking about sort of the outer ring of Metro Vancouver, parts of South Vancouver Island, which are more urban or suburban areas. Should they not have resources as well as when it comes to training and preactive? preemptive measures uh, before the wildfire season begins in their communities, again, not normally associated with fires. Uh, th th thank you for the question. Um, th there's no doubt that the, uh, the prospects for wildfires in seasons to come are, are I think everyone is uh, rightly speculating that they will be more intense, more prolonged, and as you say, uh, enter areas where they traditionally have not been expected. The program is a province-wide program. Uh, uh, and uh, the uh, the opportunity to join, I think that's uh, that's a reasonable suggestion. It is also a budgetary question, which uh, we're in the process of uh, preparing the budget for uh, uh, next year, uh, coming forward in February. So I think that's one of the considerations that may well be considered in the budget. Uh, I will also obviously take the advice of. Uh, um, Minister Ma and her experts in the emergency management and my team at BC Wildfire Service to, uh, to see how the program might best be shaped to, to protect British Columbians. And, and uh, that is our, our first priority. Next question will be from Dirk Meissner from Canadian Press. I am. <clears throat> I think this question is for... Cliff Chapman, and I'm wondering if uh, the firefighters are at all impacted by um, criticisms people have of some of the tactics you've used to fight the fires, and also if at all some of these conspiracy theories of how people, uh, how these fires started, if, those, if that at all impacted firefighters. Go ahead, Cliff. Hmm. Um, it, it's... Uh... I suppose I would say that that question really hits me and I think our organization in a in a really in a big way. Um, the easiest way I can answer that is absolutely it has an impact on our firefighters on the ground. Uh, as ministers have have discussed, 
our people are provincial in nature. Um, they don't live in these areas. Some of them do, but we bring them from all over the province. They have families. Um, they have their own homes. They have their own, in some cases, they have also been under evacuation and evacuation uh, alerts and orders. And so when they see and they turn on their phones at the end of a 14 hour shift and they see negative media and or negative social media posts about what they had done that day or what they have been doing for the course of the last three months, it has a profound impact on them. And, and we continue to work with our own organization around, you know, making sure they have the supports that they need, obviously from, uh, from this standpoint, but also just from the impacts of seeing the devastating nature of these wildfires this year. Uh, you know, we, our organization in the past, probably seven years ago and beyond, we, we were mostly in the backcountry of BC. As we have seen in the last seven years, outside of the 2003 and 2010 fire seasons, uh, we're seeing that increase in our presence in the interface where the forest meets community. And we are doing everything that we can to try to protect those homes. We are doing everything that we can to try to make sure that people can get home as fast as they can. And so it has a big impact on our staff. And again, I want to, I do want to say the messaging to our staff at our fire camps, the, the messages we receive here at in Kamloops at our headquarters have actually, for the most part, have actually been overwhelmingly positive. And I want to say that that also has a profound impact on our human, on our humans that are out there 16 hours a day, 14 days at a time with little rest in between and then doing it again. Uh, I have seen that sort of emotional uh, reaction as our staff read the thank you notes from communities, read the thank you notes from different parts of BC, even some industry members in BC saying, thank you for your effort in protecting our whatever it happens to be. So, so yes, it has a negative impact when they see some of the conspiracies and, and some of the questioning. I think we recognize that there are questions that we need to answer and we're doing our best to fill that information for all of BC. Um, but when, when things get out there on social media in particular, it can have a negative impact on our people. And I encourage everyone to continue to just show support to those that you see in the field, in particular, the reds and blues and those that are working for us with municipal departments and our contract crews. It means the world to them. It means the world to our organization. So thank you very much for that question. Our organization. So thank you very much for that question. Do you have a follow up? Sure. Uh, I think this one's for uh, Minister Ma. I'm wondering if uh, she or the government has any uh, reaction to the um, statement put out yesterday by the BC United Caucus that the government is um, holding up uh, getting supplies into the North Shushwap area. So I want to be very clear that for those communities that are not under evacuation order, that are not, uh, but are cut off by fires, supply runs are happening. They are being supplied. Uh, we are. Uh, we have a detour route in place. It was graded as part of the uh, pre-planning work, uh, so that we're able to restock stores. Uh, piloted convoys are being arranged as well when for when they're safe to allow members of the community to go out to get prescription filled and, and other uh, specific needs met. Uh, we're using the waterways when it is safe, but these supply runs have to be coordinated. There's a lot of activity in the area. We cannot get in the way of the wildfire fighting efforts. Next, we have Katie DeRosa from Vancouver Sun. Hi there. Um, uh, I'm just wondering, I mean, does the... Uh, you know, the, the tensions around uh, individuals in the shoe shop saying, you know, that they're not seeing the resources that they thought they should. Like, is this a larger issue of uh, more resources that are needed in BC? Uh, you know, we have been relying on uh, the, the military and, and other countries as well. So uh, there's consideration. There, there have been calls for a national uh, FEMA type agency that could have uh, highly trained individuals that could swoop in uh, where they are needed. So do we need more resources to, to fight fires as they get worse in the future? 
So certainly, uh, our province has been incredibly grateful for the out-of-province and international support that we have been receiving uh, throughout the wildfire season. And we do have international resources here. We have been um, re working with the federal government to have the Canadian Armed Forces uh, sent back to British Columbia to bolster those resources. We know that there is a need to surge up on firefighting resources at the peak and uh, in turn, we support other jurisdictions when they require more firefighting uh, resources when we're able to provide them as well. Uh, so there is a lot of coordination and collaboration happening. And you're right, we are currently using more firefighting resources than we would have on our own. And that's why those international partnerships are so significant. But on the Shushwap region itself, significant resources have been deployed there. And I think I'll, I'll probably turn it over to Cliff to speak a little bit more to the kind of resources that we have there. But I want to acknowledge that wildfire fighting isn't always as visible as as fighting a structural fire. Oftentimes we have resources in the bush or they're preparing or they're staging equipment. Um, they're using tactics that are different from what are seen when uh, inside the actual neighborhoods themselves and inside the, the structures. And so there's a lot of people working out there extremely hard, but they might not be uh, visible from, from where people might be. Uh, so maybe Cliff, you can elaborate on that and, and probably say, what I said more articulately, quite frankly. And I think you actually, you, you hit it really well in terms of where our, our staff are located, right? I think if you think about the Adams Lake fire itself, uh, it's 40,000 hectares. It has a significant perimeter on it that we are actively using heavy equipment and our ground resources so that that fire doesn't make another run as it has in the last as we saw last week on Thursday and Friday, trying to secure the control lines on a 40,000 hectare fire takes a significant uh, person power, both heavy equipment and ground resources. I assure you, our resources are out there. They are out there every day. They are out there for uh, every hour of the day and night, continuing to push in guard, continuing to work to try to secure the flanks or the perimeter of that fire. Um, so you may not see them all the time, or you may not see hundreds of them congregated within one certain area, but they are out there. It's it's worth noting on the Adams Lake complex, um, there are almost 600 resources that have come to the Adams Lake complex that are actively engaged on the fires in that complex. So we do have a significant resource um, front on that uh, on that fire. I think in in terms of additional resourcing, you know, this time this year in BC was really one of the first times that we ordered resources from our agencies across Canada and the world before we saw the need to have them in BC. So we put in our request. This is way back into May and June. And really, we haven't stopped asking for additional resources, sort of just to continue to supplement what we're losing. If we lose 200, trying to replace those 200. And um, so doing that in preparedness rather than waiting for a response has allowed us to have more resources in BC than we would have normally had uh, and the ability to surge to some of these fires. But again, I just want to stress when you have a 40,000 hectare fire, which is only one of a half dozen fires that are 10 to 30 uh, pushing 40,000 hectares, there is a lot of perimeter out there that we are actively working to put guards around and trying to secure that perimeter so that we can start to see the lifting of evacuation orders and alerts and start to get people home. So we are active and we are active 24 seven. Four seven. Next, we have Rob Buffum from CTV Vancouver Island. Oh, hi, thanks for taking my question. And it's for uh, Minister Ma. I'm just wondering, we've heard about these long waits and lineups of evacuees at the uh, centre, especially in the first days after this all started. Um, what could or should have been done to address that issue so the lineups weren't as big? Yeah, so first off, I want to acknowledge the Herculean efforts of the local authorities that we partner with to deliver emergency support services. Um, the the center in West Kelowna is operated by the Central Okanagan Regional District, and we've been incredibly grateful for all of their efforts and the efforts of their volunteers. That being said, they are processing an enormous number of, of evacuees, uh, a, a number that we, ha we don't normally get 
the kind of numbers that we saw over the last several days, over 30,000 on order within a matter of 24 hours. And so um, we were able to work closely with them to try to improve processes on the fly, open up evacuation centers in other areas of the region and supplement them through uh, the provision of virtual supports from other evacuation centers across the province. Uh, working with them to understand where the challenges were in processing, we uh, engaged Service BC's call center to supplement uh, all the efforts of the volunteers and the staff on the ground. We were able to call through 10,000 people registered in the evacuee registration and assistance program who are currently being supported by 13 evacuation centers, both in person and virtually across the province. We've been fast tracking processes behind the scenes and we're working closely with uh, Central Okanagan Regional District right now to expand the physical space that they have there. I, I will say that with the changing climate, what we are seeing is that the extreme weather events are happening more and more frequently, and they're happening right around uh, around the year. It used to be that uh, that communities would see a, a, an emergency situation once in a while, and they would uh, gear up on volunteers and gear up on staff and set up an evacuation center on the fly, and that's how we do it still right now. But I think there's a lot of... Uh, there certainly is a lot of thinking, a lot of conversation about where we head from here, given that we're seeing these kinds of events, not just every year, but every single season. Do you have a follow-up? I do, and it, it relates to um, the last portion of your answer there. Premier Eby this morning in a radio interview said, um, you know, something that should be given serious thought was the idea of having a year-round emergency response team the same way wildfire service functions year-round, not just during fire season. Uh, and he did reference the increasing number of natural disasters we're seeing. What are your views on that? Do you think we will see an emergency response team set up that functions year-round to anticipate these kind of emergencies? I think the Premier has been very astute in recognizing the realities of climate change and the climate impacts that have already hit here in British Columbia. And one of the first steps he took as Premier was to create this ministry, the Ministry of Emergency Management and Climate Readiness. We're about eight or nine months old now, and it was created out of the recognition that the climate crisis is here. And with that, we're seeing more extreme weather events, uh, closer together with greater frequency. Communities are being hit by emergencies while they are still struggling to recover from previous emergencies. The burden on these communities and on the people of British Columbia is growing exponentially. And so in addition to doing the work that we have to do to drive down the greenhouse gas emissions that create this uh, the climate crisis in the first place, not just here in British Columbia and across Canada, but all over the world, we also have to be prepared for the impacts of climate change that are already here. And so that means being more prepared uh, at all levels of government for the emergencies that are coming, putting more effort and more resources into mitigating the impacts of climate change, and of course being better at responding to and recovering from them. So we have time for one more reporter, and the final question goes to Kara Junos from CD News. Hi, uh, this is a question for Minister Ralston. Uh, how would you say this wildfire season starts to force your ministry to uh, change its approach to wildfire fuel management, forest management, and also empowering residents to make their communities more fire resilient? Uh, thank you. That's, uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, one of the steps we took um, in the last budget cycle was to take the core of BC Wildfire Service and expand it. There was always a small core that worked throughout the year, but we've expanded that significantly in order to uh, have more people available for the, the, prep, the advanced preparation work. But what I think some commentators have pointed out, and, and uh, I think this is a, 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 a fair insight, is that the work on fire prevention is uh, sometimes uh, uh, much smaller than the work on, on the, the firefighting. And so uh, in conjunction with uh, Minister Ma's uh, uh, new ministry, which it has as its mandate uh, dealing with uh, the response to uh, climate change, um, we will be continuing to develop 
uh, programs that are focused on on prevention uh, in advance of fires. So, uh, for example, um, the uh, one of the areas where people have uh, uh, begun to express some interest and then there'll be some change will be uh, in the building code. How do we make uh, buildings um, more uh, resilient to the prospect of fire? The Fire Smart program that we've spoken of is uh, does already exist, uh, but how do we expand that and and the just general public awareness of of what the prospects for fire might be in the future and how it's important to uh, create uh, landscapes uh, parks public places uh, and forests that uh, anticipate uh, the, the prospect of uh, of being challenged by fire in a way that, that they haven't been done in the past so it's very much i think more to shift, um, and, and, and I, I say this mindful that we are still in the middle of a very tough fire season. It is not over. The crisis continues. So, but looking forward, uh, when, when the fire season is over and into the budget cycle, uh, that's the direction that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Welfare Service and the Ministry of Force and indeed the whole of the government will be thinking of. Do you have any follow-ups? Uh, yeah, um, I guess, you know, w would you say it's fair to characterize like the last 20 years of funding for, uh, for fire prevention as underfunding? Is, is that what it has, is that what it is? And, um, you know, after this fire season, um, should British Columbians expect sort of a paradigm shift in how uh, the province approaches fire prevention? Well, um, I think a reference was made to uh, uh, former Premier Philman's report arising out of the 2003 fires, and they were in the Kelowna area. Uh, that's now 20 years ago. And some of the recommendations that were made in that report focused on the very topics that we're discussing right now. Um, similarly, there was a, a, another report done by former Cabinet Minister George Abbott and uh, Chief uh, Chapman uh, in the, the 2018 uh, that similarly uh, talked about the need to uh, develop a, a broader uh, ethic and understanding of uh, what's required for fire prevention in the future. So uh, the, the public debate has, there, has been there. I think the, sometimes the challenge is execution, but I sense that uh, Municipalities and the public, particularly after this fire season, will be much more disposed to uh, to talk about these and, and welcome the efforts and their opportunity to participate as citizens, as volunteers, as companies, as businesses uh, in the work of uh, fire prevention and general response to uh, disasters. Because as uh, Minister Ma has said, the fire is is obviously a huge challenge, but uh, other climate challenges such as uh, flooding, uh, we're in the middle of a drought as well, and that has uh, uh, implications for our water systems. Um, we, are, we are going to have to uh, rethink our responses in a profound way, and uh, our government is committed to doing that. Thank you. This has been an update on the BC wildfire situation from provincial cabinet ministers and BC wildfire service officials. Uh, what we've heard is that 10,000 British Columbians have registered for emergency services at 13 different centres. But if you still need help to find accommodation, there's a number that you can call 1-800-387-4258. 1-800-387-4258. Or online, ess.gov.bc.ca. We still have 25,000 people on evacuation order, according to Bowen Ma, the emergency management minister, 37,000 on alert. Travel restrictions are still in place in West Kelowna. They've been lifted for other areas. Uh, she says that Shoe Swap and Lake Country, uh, people in that region are asking visitors to please stay away from now, for now, even with those travel restrictions ordered. And she had a rather stern warning around people who have decided to stay, saying in some cases that can limit what BC wildfire uh, officers are and, and crew are able to do to fight fires. Uh, we'll get some of that audio to you a little bit later. Also asking for 
donations, right, Belle? And not items. Uh, they're suggesting make monetary donations to organizations like the Red Cross, SPCA, Salvation Army. We're coming up to a news break with Renee Lucas, and we'll be back right after this. News from Vancouver. Good afternoon. I'm Renee Lucas. Donald Trump's former lawyer Rudy Giuliani is putting on a brave face. Uh, to Georgia, and I'm feeling very, very good about it because I feel like I'm defending the rights of all Americans. As I did so many times as a United States attorney. Donald Trump's former lawyer Rudy Giuliani putting on a brave face before he turned himself in at an Atlanta jail. The former New York mayor was indicted last week along with Trump and 17 others on charges related to their attempts to overturn the 2020 election in Georgia. The former president is expected to do so tomorrow afternoon. The Liberal government's three-day cabinet retreat in Charlottetown wraps up today, and as we hear now from Tom Perry, it comes to a close with the party sliding in the polls and promising to tackle the housing crisis. We've got the whole team here. We've had a productive retreat, and I know we're all really excited uh, for the work ahead. With his cabinet lined up behind him as a backdrop, Justin Trudeau kicked off the final day of this retreat, promising his government will do more on big issues like housing while making few firm commitments. There have been challenges before in housing in Canada, and we've been able to solve it by working together. That's exactly what we're going to keep doing now. Trudeau's government is facing challenges of its own, trailing the Conservatives as Parliament gets set to resume. Trudeau is brushing that aside saying Conservative leader Pierre Poilievre is trying to make voters angry. Though if the polls are to be believed, that might be working. Tom Perry, CBC News, Charlottetown. The wildfires burning in Greece could go from bad to worse as winds in the forecast threaten to fan the flames. More than 200 new fires were sparked just this week. It comes as Greece and much of Europe confront yet another sweltering, sweltering heat wave. Dominic Velaitis has the latest. A firefighting helicopter takes another run at the flames which are getting ever closer to Athens. This is one of more than 350 wildfires currently burning across Greece. This particular fire began yesterday in the foothills of Mount Parnitha, about 20 kilometres to the north of the capital. It's left a trail of destruction in its path, burning homes and cars and forcing residents to flee on foot. It's a similar scene in the northeastern region of Evros, where fires have been burning out of control for five days now. It was here that the burned bodies of 18 people, believed to be migrants, were found yesterday. Their deaths making up the majority of the 20 people who've been killed so far as a result of these fires. Dominic Valaitis, CBC News, London. Officials in Russia are working to identify remains of several air crash victims. It is believed Yevgeny Prigozhin, the infamous boss of the Wagner mercenary group, is among them. Chris Brown has more. Video shot from the ground shows the Embraer business jet apparently already on fire, spinning into the ground and exploding in a ball of flames. And while Russian news sources say mercenary leader Evgeny Prigozhin was on the passenger list, there is no evidence yet he was among the 10 dead. But it wouldn't be a surprise. Prigozhin appeared to be a man living on borrowed time since his failed mutiny in June. It humiliated President Vladimir Putin and embarrassed Russia's defense ministry. The apparent truce afterward that appeared to let him travel to and from Russia was a surprise given the ruthlessness with which Putin has eliminated other rivals in the past. Whether it was a missile or something else that brought it down, there was reportedly a second Prigozhin owned jet in the air nearby, so the questions will now focus on who precisely was on each plane. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. And the Northwest Territories government is trying to assure displaced residents that it will help them get home safe when it is safe to return. On Monday, officials said the territory would not help cover travel costs for evacuees who use their own vehicle. But last night, Finance Minister Carolyn Wozniak acknowledged some people will need financial help. Still, she says the territory's finances are being stretched. The fire suppression costs are astronomical. So we have to figure all this out within our capacity and our means, but no one is saying no. We're saying let us do some policy work so we can figure out what a good option is. Wozniak promised that 
the government will not leave anyone behind. And that's the CBC News from Vancouver, 88.1 FM and 690 AM in Vancouver. For news anytime, go to cbc.ca or use the CBC News app. Now a look at the weather. Air quality and special weather statements are in place for some areas. Along the south coast, a chance of showers with highs of 22 degrees. For the southern interior, the Kootenays. And for the Peace, a chance of showers with a risk of thunderstorm. Highs between 17 and 22. For the central interior, risk of a thunderstorm, local smoke. Steady temperatures around 14. And on the north coast, chance of showers with a high of 15. And now to BC Today with Dan Burrett and Belle Peary. Thank you so much, Renee, and welcome back to this extended uh, edition mm-hmm. of BC Today. I am Belle Puri, joined with Dan Burrett. Uh, in the last hour, we just heard from provincial officials uh, update of what the situation is. Uh, looking a little bit better, but mm-hmm. uh, some stability, yet we know that you know, there's a lot happening out there. Absolutely, and uh, we appreciate the, those of you who have emailed and called us. We, in fact, have a call on the line. We're going to get to that in just a few moments. Uh, so let's do a quick recap, uh, perhaps a bit more than we heard uh, uh, in the news. Uh, we hinted at this before the news around the messaging uh, from uh, Bowen Ma, the emergency management minister. Uh, perhaps the uh, the most mm, stern, if we can call it that, Bill, uh, message that she delivered delivered to people who have decided uh, not to uh, leave an area when an evacuation order is in place. She argued that if people don't leave, it can limit how BC Wildfire Service can fight some of those fires. She says they are trying to connect with people who have decided to stay, and they're also contacting people with experience in fighting wildfires and fires in general. We've certainly heard from a number of you who have decide, who have uh, contacted us, uh, ready to go, uh, whether it's with logistics or perhaps on the front lines. Uh, we have an, uh, a clip from uh, Bowen. Why don't we take a listen to that now? I recognize that it is an a remarkably difficult time for people under an evacuation order. It is difficult to leave behind your home and everything that you love. But evacuation orders must be followed. They are not suggestions, they are the law. When unauthorized people are in evacuation areas, it escalates the danger involved for everyone. It also limits the kind of wildfire fighting tactics that the BC Wildfire Service can deploy and it redirects critical resources away from the wildfire fight itself into searching for moving equipment, moved equipment, redoing work that's already been done to set up structural protection, or just trying to manage an unpredictable situation made even more unpredictable by well-meaning but uncoordinated firefighting efforts. I know that some people want to stay and fight. I understand that but it is also my duty to be clear about the risks to people and emergency crews. This has become an increasingly divisive issue within the community and outside. And let me be clear, our collective fight is with the wildfire. But in order to do this, our efforts need to be united. We need to work together, not against each other. BC Wildfire Service personnel are actively working to open up a dialogue with those behind the lines who are refusing to leave to try to create an understanding of the seriousness of the situation. And as they've done in the past, in other communities, BC Wildfire Service is reaching out proactive... And as they've done in the past, in other communities, the BC Wildfire Service is reaching out to skilled, experienced people in the Shushwap to try and incorporate them into their work. We have to be working together on this, though. People can't be doing their own thing. We can't have equipment that's been staged for firefighters being moved, so it's not there when it's needed. That puts the whole unified strategy at risk, and it puts people and their homes at risk. We have a shared challenge we're trying to fight, and that is the wildfire, and we fight it by working together. But I want to be clear that we're talking about skilled, experienced people in this case. My message to British Columbians is that evacuation orders must be followed. Fires are unpredictable, and they move fast. Areas under evacuation order are not safe places, and when you are asked to leave, you must leave immediately. 
That's Emergency Management Minister Bowen Ma, uh, very clear on the provincial government's position when there are evacuation orders and some people choose not to leave. The message, uh, following any evacuation order, you must leave the area. The minister says that it is the law, and it's been something certainly a lot of people have been... um, there's been pushback, uh, and the government doesn't seem to be budging um, and easing up on what their position is. We're going to go to the phone lines, and Jane is calling us from Vancouver. Hi there, Jane. Hello, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Thanks for calling us. What are your thoughts on uh, on this matter of evacuation order and staying or going? Well, My son lives in Lee Creek, so that's the North Shoe Shop, and um, he was very prepared to go. At the beginning of the summer, just due to the fires, he always uh, packs up a lot of his things and moves them into storage in in Chase. So he was, I don't think anybody could have been more prepared than he was, and and he did evacuate. He said he was out of there because he could see what was happening and how bad it was going to be. And he left and was um, went to a friend's house, and then he was evacuated, so he went to another friend's house. So he was out during the worst um, of the fires last weekend. And then he started um, hearing from his neighbours who live on the hill that he's on that um, a lot of their homes had burnt and there was a lot of spot fires. The fire had obviously moved on towards Scotch Creek and Solista, but there was still a lot of fire. So um, he actually went back. And he, he intended to honour that evac order until um, his neighbours were desperate because there were no firefighters around. And, 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 and um, uh, I think they were deployed somewhere else. And even the place that they were staying just down the road from him got totally wiped out. Everything was burned that they had in their camp. So it was a very... And, and we're the last ones to want to put any kind of firefighters or volunteers in danger. He was a forester for 20 years. He um, pretty much lives off the land. He has his own business. He operates without internet and TV, and he's very self-sufficient. So he went back, and some of his friends went back to put out the, the spot fires on the mountain or the hill where he lives, and they literally saved many of the homes that were still standing. And how did they? His. How did they do that? What did they use for equipment? They were just using what they had, and there what was, was that? A twenty thousand. I think it's just hoses, and uh, there was a couple of um, volunteers, one from Silver Creek um, and uh, uh, fire crews that did show up, and so they were helping them, and they were grateful for their help, for the locals' help around that. But it's mostly just using the equipment that they have. There, you know, there's no, there's no water. There's a twenty thousand dollar or twenty thousand gallon tank on the hill that um, no one came to fill up. So it's just picks and axe and shovels and whatever they have. Jane, if can I ask you, we heard from Emergency Management Minister Bowen Ma, who argued that those some of those people who did choose to say, stay behind can limit how BC Wildfire Service can fight some of the fires because they are concerned about hurting people or, or that that that, that their their wildfire firefighting tactics may injure people or perhaps uh, god forbid worse uh, what do you and what do you think your son would say to that well i think you know uh he would absolutely agree to that as i said no one wants and he especially none of the locals want anybody to you know get injured or killed or put them in danger or jeopardy the thing is there wasn't anybody there for days. It was just the locals on the mountain until the volunteer fire department showed up, and they were really happy to have their their help. And when the BCWS did show up, they were like, don't touch my stuff, stay away from this, you know. Um, so it was, um, it was a completely different response from uh, BCWS and the local volunteer fire department that were saying, you know, turn this hose or, or turn this, this valve or whatever, you know. But my main issue right now is because they're, you know, they're, they're literally trapped. You know, he basically said um, the Army is blocking the Squilocks Bridge and the RCMP are blocking the Scotch Creek Bridge and they're not allowed to go on the Squilocks Anglement Road or they'll be escorted out or not allowed back in. 
and he's pretty good for food and water, but people up there need some gas. So he he basically says that could someone on the outside get a hold of our, you know, the elected officials and tell them to let us get supplies, keep the roadblocks up, but let, let supplies come in. He doesn't need any looky-loos or looters driving around. And he wants, his, his, my buddy wants to get his family back and I'd like to get my dogs back. So they are just looking for supplies. Jen, we appreciate your call. Uh, we hope that your son stays safe and uh, we, we appreciate your perspective. I want to share a few others right now. Uh, we've received num- uh, numerous emails and we appreciate them. Brenda and Courtney writes, I'm curious to know how many of the people who chose to stay against evacuation orders and fight the fires have home insurance. It's common knowledge that many rural properties and houses do not have home insurance. I don't know if we have a number on that or whether we can confirm that. Mark emails to say, I'm sorry to say this, but the people who stay behind put professionals at risk. That was a sentiment we heard from Bowen Ma. Marie says, I agree with the caller who suggested people who choose not to evacuate would sign a disclaimer. People need to take personal responsibility. And Linda writes, the controversy about who fights fire, uh, BC wildfire only versus local, also occurred here in the West Kootenays a few years ago. This is logging country, a wealth of local loggers who know the terrain, the roads, the wind and weather patterns, availability of water sources, and have the equipment needed. In the past, they were very active as ad hoc firefighters. I wonder if the current rules are about liability and not reflective of the current situation. That's a very interesting perspective, Linda. We uh, we appreciate it. And if you have any more questions, comments for us, email us, bctoday at cbc.ca. You can always give us a call, 1-800-825-5950. Metro Vancouver at 604-669-3733, pound 690 on your cell phone. Please uh, be pulled over or hands-free when you do that. And, you know, we know that uh, weather is a key factor in all of this effort to fight the wildfire. So we're going to get some information on that from uh, Darius Madavi. He is our CBC News climate and science specialist. Hello to you. Hello. So driving in, certainly in Metro Vancouver this morning, I actually had some raindrops on my windshield. Nice to Um, hear. And uh, nice to hear also that in West Kelowna, I think, what was it, 22 millimeters of rain. Um, But it's my understanding there are actually rainfall warnings in parts of the province. So that Mm -hmm. sounds like good news, (laughs) but there's a risk as well? Yes, definitely. Uh, We did see a good amount of rainfall in some of the places we were really hoping for it. Now that uh, rainfall is moving further north in the province. So we have uh, two major rainfall warnings in place. One is uh, in parts of the uh, central part of the province, uh, Chilcotin. They are seeing are expecting to see anywhere from 15 to 25 millimeters over the next uh, few hours. So uh, it's quite a bit. It could cause some flash floods, uh, some cause some, some places to, to just really get a, a, a fill up with rain. A lot of these basins could mm-hmm. could become quite, quite swamped. Uh, but the real concern is further up north in the South Peace, where we're expecting anywhere from 70 to 90 millimeters of rain. Wow. Yes, and <sighs> given the drought conditions across the province, uh, in a drought situation, soils become very hydrophobic, meaning they repel water. Uh, the top layers of soil just when they dry out, they repel water rather than absorbing it. So when we see this much rain come down at once, it doesn't have time to soak into that top layer very, very slowly and and reduce that um, that quality to let it absorb water again. So instead, it just all runs right off. And so it's a severe risk of flash flooding. 90 millimeters at any time would be of a severe risk. But this year especially, this could be a, a, a very big deal. And if it's in a fire region, does the fire evaporate this rain? Yeah, so this is a, a great question uh, because you'd expect that over a, a large wildfire, as the rain falls, it would get near the fire and just evaporate. And that is, to an extent, true. Uh, if you have lighter rain as it falls over the fire area, that rain will just poof. But it's not all bad news. It still has an effect because it raises the humidity, it brings temperatures down, uh, and then the area around the fire will still get the rainfall, and that'll stop the fire from spreading into those areas, at least for a short time, as some of those uh, smaller, lighter fuels on top do get soaked. Uh, So it sort of slows the fire spread. It can reduce the intensity of the fire, even where the rain falls directly over it. Um, So 
some potentially very good news coming from that rainfall if it's light. Uh, if it's really heavy rain, then some of that water could actually even make it down to the ground over the fire area. So it really depends. But uh, good news no matter what if we get some rain in these these spots. We have several regions we want to cover. Let's talk about Lytton. Uh, mm. The wildfires there spread last night. We've seen these expanded evacuation orders. What's the situation there with the weather? Things are, I, I wouldn't expect spread like we saw last night again. Mm -hmm. Last night we had very strong winds blowing from the south. Uh, the winds were uh, consistently 30 kilometers per hour, gusting above 50, close to 60 kilometers an hour. Uh, I don't expect that that is going to happen again. It's not in the forecast. Uh, that was what was really fueling that rapid expansion. Uh, I should note, temperatures are going to come up over the next couple days uh, very slowly. So heading into the weekend, temperatures should return to seasonal in the interior and then climb just above, we're talking three to six degrees Celsius at mm -hmm. times above seasonal, not a heat wave like we were seeing before, but warmer temperatures for sure, but coming with some settled weather as well. And finally, Darius, we appreciate your time. For our listeners and viewers in, Vic in Metro Vancouver, the south coast, Victoria, a word on the smoke. What's that mm. situation? Today cleared up pretty nice. Mm -hmm. I think yesterday were our clearest skies. Uh, tomorrow, a bit of the smoke will return. We have another low pressure system setting up on the coast, and that's just sort of going to draw some of that smoke in. Sorry, draw some of that smoke in, turned away from the microphone. Uh, and then because the air just wants to move into the, the spot where there's less air because mm -hmm. it's low pressure. Uh, but it's a temporary thing. The low pressure system will move again, dissipate once again, uh, and then that smoke will not be drawn in again unless we have another low pressure system set up. So and, and less, so, uh, so, sorry, go ahead. And sorry, what's the timeline on that? Uh, so tomorrow, expect a bit more smoke. Friday, Maybe the smoke lingers a little bit more. Heading into the weekend, the smoke is expected to dissipate once more, uh, but not, I should say, not as smoky as we were early this week. Mm -hmm. That was because the winds were actually blowing the uh, smoke this way. This time, it's just that smoke sort of being drawn in towards Vancouver, so slightly better than before. Lots going on, and Darius, we've uh, we've been <laughs> you've been very patient with us as we move around, and uh, so thanks so much for for accommodating us. And we'll Anytime. and we'll see you tonight on CBC Vancouver TV, and you can watch online and on TV at uh, six o'clock and at eleven. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank right. you, thank you, Darius. Uh, you know, one of the things that we heard in the news conference uh, just before the two o'clock mm -hmm. news, uh, you know, a lot of people want to help uh, British Columbians who are not feeling the immediate uh, direct impact of the force fires. Uh, so they're thinking, you know, well, people must need clothes. They must yes. need, need furniture. They must need blankets, you know, all these things. But uh, as all of that is true, but that's not what officials can deal with right now and volunteers. So uh, the uh, suggestion from provincial officials is if you want to help make, think about donating um, cash. Yes. You know, to the Red Cross, to the Salvation Army, uh, to the SPCA, where that can be put to use as opposed to the logistics of having to handle actual items. Yeah, very good advice. And uh, most of that can be done online with uh, reputable agencies. Again, go with the reputable agencies. And we do know that and we've seen uh, from uh, the reports from the BC SPCA and else other um, organizations that we've spoken with that uh, it's not just people that are being affected. A lot of pets. Uh, a lot of pet parents worried out there, and of course, wildlife, as uh, as we talked about as well. And uh, we heard from uh, Premier David Eby uh, this yes. morning, keeping in mind that yesterday he toured different uh, fire regions of the province with some of his cabinet colleagues. Uh, let's take a listen to what he had to say this morning to our friends at CBC News Network. I have a huge amount of empathy for that. I, I can't imagine uh, what I would do placed in the same situation. But the big challenge for the province, for the wildfire service is uh, what we have right now is people staying behind, trying to do things on their own, uh, separately from the wildfire response. Uh, it puts them at risk. We, we've seen remarkable and unexpected fire activity out of this fire. Uh, our wildfire service captured a fire tornado. We had a fire that moved uh, 20 kilometers in a 12 hour period. We've had fires spot two and a half kilometers away from the body of the fire. Usually the fire service expects a two kilometer radius. And so even the most experienced people have been surprised by this activity. 
That's uh, BC Premier David Eby. And our reporter, Justin McElroy, did some analysis of the discussion around wildfire fighting in the Shushwap on cbc.ca. And he joins us in studio now. Hello, Justin. Hello, Bill. Uh, you know, wh- what have CBC reporters been hearing about the um, feelings about firefighting efforts in the Shushwap? Uh, anger, frustration, stress, anxiety. Uh, You know, these things happen in all wildfires to some extent. Uh, Anytime that your home is either destroyed or there's the uh, potential of it and a community is under siege for days and days, uh, these tensions come in. But to a far greater extent than most wildfires and with a far greater percentage of the population are reporters talking to folks uh, in uh, Scotch Creek, in Lee Creek, further up Shushwap, uh, have heard from uh, people time and time again a frustration with both the government's lack of communication on Friday and Saturday when uh, this fire started to come in really, really fast. Now, the government didn't couldn't do much about the speed of the fire, but certainly because of the time of the day and because issues with the regional district, uh, lots of people weren't warned very quickly. But then in the aftermath, once this became an evacuation order zone, the blockades that were put in, the province's first reaction to tell everyone, no, don't provide help, let us do everything, really came and clashed with a culture that had developed there, but both organically uh, through years and years in the shoe swap, but also over the previous two days when folks were fighting the fires themselves, they wanted to continue to do so. They were now being told uh, they couldn't, in some cases ordered by police. Uh, And so whether they were folks that stayed in the area that we spoke to or people that had evacuated to Kamloops, There was a real widespread feeling that uh, there was more that people could have done and frustration with how the government was talking about what should be done in this situation. And, you know, it wasn't just talk. Some of them took some drastic action as well. As you're saying, you know, I mean, they stayed, they refused to go, they Mm -hmm. went back. Um, You know, how serious are those actions? Uh, You know, certainly some of them are quite serious. And we heard the allegations of stealing equipment. And sometimes I'm sure it was outright theft. In a lot of situations, though, the situation was a little bit more nuanced than that. You had people that felt they couldn't get out because they had heard about the roads being trapped. And, uh, you know, the North Shoe Swap is a lot of isolated communities, rural areas, uh, not exactly highways getting out. So they were staying, they were fighting. They didn't see a large presence of BC wildfires filed wildfire service people uh, and then uh, they're told after two days of them trying to do the best that they can to try and protect their homes to not do anything more to stay in their house to not accept aid from anywhere else uh, and that was extremely frustrating for folks and uh, you know we heard from the premier uh, there's some empathy but more empathy for their situation today than maybe was professed by the government in the previous couple days Justin we can we can hear your analysis piece or read read your analysis piece we're hearing you right now. I'm getting my mind around this at cbc.ca slash bc. Uh, What kind of reaction have you had specifically to your article? Uh, You know, there's lots of people in the region that uh, have been uh, great, you know, happy that those voices have been uh, heard, uh, that acknowledging a lot of the tension that they're seeing on local Facebook pages or in phone calls. So, you know, if they're in Kamloops and hearing back from loved ones of what's going on there. There's also folks that have uh, said, look, I think, you know, we should highlight more the stealing of equipment and that that shouldn't be condoned in any way. And uh, it's a fair point. It's also something easy to be said when you're further away and uh, you're not talking to folks on the ground who feel extremely stressed out and may not know the full context of where this equipment uh, came from in some cases. But it just speaks to the chaotic situation that developed there because of the geography of the North Shushwap, because of how quickly the fire spread because of, you know, the aquatic nature of it is, you know, people are coming to these evacuation zones by boats. Uh, you know, it's easier to sort of break a blockade or people feeling that they can get into a region like that than, say,
say if it was not next to a lake and the roads are closed and what are you going to do? So there's a whole bunch of factors there that make this a, a difficult situation, both for the provincial government uh, and for folks who stayed behind either by choice or because they felt they had no option. You're listening to an extended version of BC Today. Justin McElroy is in our studio looking at the case of the tension around the shoe swap, particularly with people who have decided to stay and the or, and the um, 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 uh, the government imploring people to get out. Justin is going to stick with us right after this news update coming up to the bottom of the hour with Renee Lucas. <laughs> Good afternoon. Here are the headlines from the CBC Vancouver Newsroom. I'm Renee Lucas. A man has died after he was hit by a transit bus in Vancouver this morning. The incident happened near Fleming Street and East 41st Avenue just after 6 a.m. The 60-year-old victim was rushed to hospital but didn't survive. Police say an investigation is underway but speed and impairment are not considered factors. BC Transit has launched a new electronic payment for riders in Greater Victoria. People can now use the UMO app or by loading a free card. UMO will be available in communities across BC with a phased rollout that will be completed by fall of 2024. Surrey RCMP say two men have been charged after an altercation in the city Friday left a man with life-threatening in- injuries. They say officers responded to multiple, multiple reports of a man walking around a parking lot with a machete. He allegedly used it to strike a vehicle. RCMP say that prompted an altercation with people in the vehicle and sent a 55-year-old man to hospital. A 31-year-old and 21-year-old are both charged with aggravated assault and remain in custody. Kamloops RCMP have made an arrest involving the theft of gear used to fight wildfires. One suspect, a youth known to police, has been released from custody until charges are approved. Anyone with information about these thefts or others that may be related is asked to please contact the RCMP in Kamloops. Taking a look at the weather, a mix of sun and cloud today in Vancouver, high of 19, low of 13. Thank you so much, Renee, and welcome back to this extended uh, version of BC Today. I'm Belle Puri with Dan Burt, and we are joined by our colleague Justin McElroy in studio, uh, talking about the situation uh, where there are evacuation orders and some people choose to stay behind. Uh, Justin has, has filed an analysis piece on uh, cbc.ca slash bc about this. And, you know, Justin, we were hearing from Cliff Chapman uh, from the BC Wildfire Service, uh, um, the impact of criticism on firefighters, on his crews, and and he was saying it was it's quite profound because you know some of them themselves are under alert or evacuation order. Um, some have come from other places. Uh, there's just a lot of elements that play into this. Yeah, a lot of stress on all sides, right? And nobody when they're doing their job and they're going into uh, emergency situations and they're trained and they're professionals and they have so much sympathy for the people in these situations. And in some cases, they're getting yelled at. In one case, we've heard of, uh, of firefighters getting thrown g- garbage at. Uh, you know, the folks on the other side would say it's not towards them personally. It's towards the fact that they feel trapped and they can't help to, uh, and they're being to, uh, ordered to go back into their homes. Uh, uh, but it it really speaks to, to just how long this wildfire season has been. And in the case of the shoe swap, you know, it's been four or five days of an interface fire, of it being really heavy, close to homes in a way that we typically don't see quite as much that close to properties. And so you have these stressful conversations happening quite often over a long period of time when, again, these uh, firefighters uh, uh, coming in were a bit behind the eight ball in in terms of the reaction they would get because they were a little bit slower. Now, that's no mark knock on them. There were so many fires happening. The McDougal Creek one close to Kelowna was taking up a lot of attention. This fire, the Bush Creek one, moved so quickly on Friday, then it's an overnight one as well. It's hard to get to all these communities. You can fully understand everyone's side on it. But in terms of the perception in a lot of these communities, it was really tough for them. They were fighting an uphill start to begin with when they entered in. Uh, And then you have these tense conversations and being told, no, you have to go back to your home or no, this boat full of aid equipment that people are trying to get to you, you can't use. Um, It's no wonder that things are going to get stressful. 
We'd love to hear from you now. Give us a call, 1-800-825-5950. Our number in Metro Vancouver, 604-669-3733, pound 690 on your cell phone. You can email us, bctoday at cbc.ca. What is going through your mind as BC goes through another grinding season of wildfires? Perhaps you've been ordered to leave. Have you done so? What's happening near you? Justin, I'm going to ask you a geography and lake question. You have a slight background in that. It's possible. <clears throat> So remind us, for people who have not been in and around the Shushwap, um, A, it's spectacular, Mm -hmm. beautiful, amongst the most beautiful places on earth. What are crews and people who are living there dealing with the elements? What is there? I mean, in terms of the area most specifically impacted, it's the it's the northwest end. Mm-hmm. So to, to people to, might think uh, and have driven by the shoe swap on Highway 1. That's on the south end. Now, to get to your to, uh, Scotch Creek, your Lee Creek, your Celeste, your Anglemonts, you're taking a, a road up north. It's not quite a logging road, uh, but it's not a, a exactly nice, clean pavement all, all the way through. Uh, you have the fact that the uh, the bridge for a while there was rumors it's a wooden bridge that yes. connects that 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 people didn't know whether that was burned people thought it might be because of the conditions social media rumors being what they are it was confirmed that it stayed up but mm-hmm. you still at a certain point have that closed off once it's an evacuation order zone and once bc wildfire service comes in but again part of the thing with the shoe swap lake is you have so many of these small communities and it's such a boating first uh region of the province and that lake in particular that that you have all these different ways where when people were both evacuating, they could go from boat, from community to community, and as well for people wanting to try and help or re-enter, lots of different ways for people to go in. So in terms of a government and a wildfire service trying to get to an area and create a containment field in the way that you might for a normal forest fire, and well, how could people get in and, uh, and what are the risks uh, to the population and for people trying to get into the situation, it's a lot more difficult when you talk about the shoe swap than a typical wildfire that uh, they might experience. And of course, limit as much as we can say this, limited resources when it comes to what they're having to fight and, and the priorities that, that they have to make. A lot of these wildfire ec- experts are, I mean, they have decades in training. But we, as we've also heard from a number of our callers and uh, uh, emailers and listeners, uh, a lot of people uh, up there uh, have experience with with being outdoors, being self sufficient, as we heard. Uh, let's go to Leanna, who is in the North Okanagan. Uh, Leanna, thanks for joining us. Uh, what's your situation? Um, so, hi there. Thanks for having me. First of all, um, my situation is that our family runs a ranch um, with livestock, cattle, and sheep. And my concern is, I'm sitting out here feeling like a sitting duck are surrounded by heavily forested areas, watching these lightning storms come through and wondering who is coming to help me if a fire starts here when the wildfire service is focused in Kelowna and the Shushwap. So, like, I, I have to stay and fight for my home and my livestock um, because who else is going to come out here? Like, we can't, we can't just sit here and watch our places burn down. You know? Yeah. What are you equipped and able to do to save your livestock and your property? So, I mean, like running a ranch, you own heavy pieces of equipment, tractors, excavators, uh, bulldozers. Uh, We are lucky that we have a creek running through our property, um, which provides us with gravity-fed water. So we are not reliant on, you know, empty fire hydrants and, uh, you know, tankers and bladders and that sort of thing like we are able to help ourselves if we really really had to at least attempt to you know like so i i fully understand i would never want to put uh you know a fire a firefighter in any type of danger i would never want to do that but at the same time with multiple raging wildfires close to us like we're within two hours of both of the places that are on fire right now like, where is the staffing? Like, there's no, who's going to come? We've also heard, though, um, that the way some of these fires are being fought, uh, when we, you know, people say, we don't see any firefighters, and BC uh, Wildfire Service is telling us that 
they are being fought, uh, you know, from different angles, uh, perhaps not, you know, you can't see the firefighters, but that they are there. For sure. And I think that, you know, there is a chance that those firefighters are there. But if they're if we're talking about, like, in my area, we're talking about people that have hundred between each of us. And in my situation, I am literally surrounded by heavy forests, like crown land forests on all four sides of myself. So, like, yeah, there might be someone, you know, 200 acres over from me fighting at my neighbor's house. But if I literally don't see a helicopter, <laughs> like, flying over me or see people directly where I am, of course I'm going to assume that there's no one here. You know, like, and I... <sighs> I don't know. I just think like if someone came to our property and said, you have to leave, we would say we actually won't. And Leanna, we appreciate your call. Last question to you. Would this be a situation, we've had an email about this, that if they came to you, authorities, police, wildfire officials, and said, you have to leave, and you said, we don't, and they handed you a form and said, okay, well, you have to release yourself from liability. Is that something you'd sign? You know, I, I'm not going to speak on behalf of my husband, who I, I don't know that he would sign it. <laughs> fair <laughs> fair enough, but you. what would you do? Right? Myself, because I would be with our, our children too, I I don't know. I guess in the heat of the moment, I would probably, if I needed them to just leave and get them out of here so that I could continue trying to save my place, I probably would sign it. Leanna, we really yeah. appreciate your call. Um, thank you, for, thank you for joining us, and let's hope that that never that it never comes to that. Um, mm-hmm. It certainly is reality that a lot of people are facing right now. Absolutely. Uh, we also have Marie on the line. Marie is in Surrey this afternoon. Hello to you. Hello. What can you tell us? Uh, are you do you have a connection to the fires? Um, I have a cabin in Hundred Mile House. Um, and four years ago, the Elephant Hill fire was uh, sort of an eye-opener for me and the vulnerability that I face as a, a property owner. And I started to develop a fire plan for my property. Um, it, it's just, it's not realistic to for each owner to uh, rely upon government intervention in these fires. Like, they do not have the firefighters, the equipment, to deal with the kind of fires that we're dealing with. And if you have a proper plan in place and are educated enough, I don't understand why there's this blockading going on. Um, I mean, I don't think it's, 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 it, it's conscionable for people to, you know, take fire equipment that has been set aside for the fire departments. But uh, the reality is time and time again, it has been demonstrated that private property owners have been able to manage their own properties and protecting their own properties with no risk to life uh, or no loss of life. You know, there might be risk, but there's certainly not a loss of life. And I don't understand why the government feels, and you hear it time and again, that uh, if I was to be on my property, I'm putting firefighters at risk. I don't understand that. Justin, that's uh, similar to a lot of what you were saying that reporters have been hearing. Yeah, and you listen to Liana there, right? And uh, it's a similar, what she was saying as a hypothetical is close to the very reality that folks in the shoe swap had, where they saw a lot of attention being placed on uh, the West Kelowna, Kelowna McDougal Creek uh, area. And uh, look, there's so many wildfires happening in the province right now. It is a situation of triage and assessing threats and risk. And as we heard from uh, Premier David Eby about 10 minutes ago when we played some of his uh, comments today, he talked about how quickly the fire in the shoe swap spread and how it did catch people by surprise simply because you don't see for modeling that sort of speed happening. And so uh, what that does, though, is it creates an accelerant uh, 
uh, worry for folks in other communities that went, well, this is what happened there. If it happened in the shoe swap, it could happen in the North Okanagan. It could happen in the Kootenays. It could happen in the Caribou. It could happen in so many places where you have more of these thinner canyons where to, that fire can come up with you just like that. And it forces you to have those thoughts and hypotheticals in the back of your mind of what you're going to do. And it's easy to sort of say, well, rationally, if the province told me these are the evacuation rules and I saw these professionals, I would leave and do that. But but as we're hearing from people on the lines and as how we've seen over the last four days, it's not that simple all the time. It's not that simple and it's not human nature. You can't just say, oh, OK, I'm leaving my life behind and doing what you're telling me to do. And the diversity of the province, as we've heard from from uh, people, uh, puts different perspectives on things, right? If you feel as though you're self-sufficient out there, uh, then absolutely you may have a, a, a very different reaction if a wildland firefighter comes to you or a government official and says you need to get out. We have another call on the line we'd like to get to. Kim is joining us from Vancouver. Uh, Kim, thanks for joining me for the discussion. What do you think? Hi. Um, so I fought forest fires for seven years in Ontario, northern Ontario to be exact. So my opinion is coming from some experience, and I want to let everyone listening know that with the conditions that we had in BC this summer, when you add 50 kilometer an hour winds to that, absolutely nothing can stop the fire. Nothing. So it doesn't matter if you have 17 water bombers. It doesn't matter if you have buckets from helicopters. The winds propel the heat, and <laughs> nothing can ha You can't stop it. And so these people who are staying home thinking that their garden hose is going to have some effect, I, I mean, I'm actually surprised there weren't more deaths in this situation because that is extraordinarily dangerous. Kim, we know we heard from uh, wildfire information officers who were telling us at one point, one of the blazes, and perhaps Justin or Bell can remind me which one it was, might have been the Adams Lake Complex. Forest Tower told us that it moved 20 kilometers in half a day? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yes. And and you can't. You you know, the thing is, the water that's falling from the bombers or, or the, or the um, helicopters, it's evaporating before it gets to the trees. Like, like the heat is so intense, so intense that that you, you you just you can't stop it. And with winds that strong, it, I mean, I understand people want to save their homes, and I understand that it's you know it's a it's a frustrating situation. But they're risking their life. They're literally risking their life doing that when the situation was what it was. It's it's really quite horrific how fast that can go. Justin? Yeah. Uh, I, I do want to provide some additional context, though, in the case of uh, Shoe Swap, where the, the areas impacted were not under evacuation order right. until very, very quickly they were. And then in some cases, by the time people found out about it late on a Friday, they hear that the highway is, they see videos of the highway burning. They hear rumors of the bridge being uh, burned down. Uh, it, it creates a, a very difficult uh, situation where people aren't quite sure in the moment what exactly to do when you combine with uh, isolated roads a different situation again Kelowna most of the areas evacuated it was a five minute drive to a major highway sure. uh, pretty easy to get out uh, the calculus was a little bit different in the shoe swap for uh, folks and that added in into why I think so many people stayed behind uh, as opposed to what we saw in the Kelowna's Justin, thank you so much for your analysis. Uh, it's Justin McElroy from the mm. CBC Vancouver Newsroom, and you can read his piece on cbc.ca slash bc. 
I, this may well be BC's most destructive wildfire season ever, and many are affected by the smoke and fire, and a lot of them are now considering moving because of it. Uh, the most striking figure, well, one in four young people said, yes, they're thinking about heading elsewhere. So we want to hear from you. Could BC wildfires trigger you to move, to leave BC, leave your region? Give us a call, 1-800-825-5950. 604-669-3733. If you're on your cell phone, it's star or pound 690. Email bctoday at cbc.ca. Joining us now to tell us more about this study is Shachi Curl, president of the Angus Reed Institute. Thanks for making time for us. Hi, Shachi. Hi, Bill. Hey, Dan. Hey, Justin, if you're still there. Yeah, he's he's gone, but we'll <laughs> pass right. it along. Listen, why did you want to ask this question, you know, about would you move because of the smoke and fires? I mean, it's really about impact. And as we, as as you've been talking about, as we've been thinking about, um, it's it's so much now about disaster response or emergency preparedness. And there are so many um, parallel stories these days around insurance companies saying they won't insure or um, governments and, and, and emergency preparedness plans saying, look, there's only so much we can do. And as your last caller just pointed out, if, if winds are blowing at 50 kilometers an hour, if you've got fire that is unstoppable, um, do you want to sink your, your life savings? Do you want to sink your life and your livelihood into a situation that uh, despite the best plans available or the best efforts available, simply may not be preventable. And it's it's not just fires, it's floods. You know, we're having conversations increasingly in the wake of, of hurricanes and tropical storms uh, around low-lying communities, uh, post-tsunamis. Uh, there's There's been con- concerns and conversations even in in and around Metro Vancouver about low-lying communities such as Richmond, you know, are the dike systems okay? And in the in all of that, what we wanted to do was understand a couple of things. First of all, who's been affected by wildfire smoke in Canada, in British Columbia in, in this summer? And secondly, again, the, the impact of that in terms of looking at your whole life, what might that mean? And so what we found are... Numbers that I think are really unprecedented, 88% of Canadians saying they've been affected by wildfire smoke or, or other wildfire uh, fumes and uh, impacts or, or, or you know, the, the fires themselves in terms of having to get out of Dodge, so to speak. Um, that's a massive number, folks. And, you know, in, in British Columbia and Western Canada, it's not unusual for us to be dealing with particulate and haze or really terrible smoke or evacuation orders. But this was the year that Toronto woke up. This is the year that it hit central Canada. And all of a sudden they're realizing that, you know, welcome to what people in Alberta, British Columbia and Western Canada and Northern Canada have been dealing with for a long time. Mm. And you see it in terms of the impact about what people think they might want to do in terms of how they structure their lives. Let's go to a call now. Simon is joining us from Summerland. Simon, what's your experience? Howdy. Well, uh, I've been living in Summerland for a few years, lived in Kelowna for a few years before that, and uh, unfortunately, no stranger to fires. Um, but in regards to your question about young folks moving around and going to different places, like you start sitting down and doing some real serious calculus about it, and to an extent, it almost doesn't matter anymore. The climate shifted so much, droughts are so widespread. You go almost to the North Pole, and you're still getting issues up there. It, it's it's as far as like escaping fires and moving around in that regard. You got to plan less so on that. And at least to me personally, it's more about where can you find a supportive community? Where can you find some place where you can have disaster relief uh, relief resources? Where can you move to a place that where the province has adequately put resources and funding in, into making sure that pe- they can support people who do need to flee, who do need to get out of get out of some place if they got to get out of some place, and you know. So you're just gonna stay put and deal with what Mother Nature presents to you wherever you happen to be. Yeah, because like in, in the end, she's gonna win. There's there's only so much we can do about it, and what really matters is. 
it, 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 it's about having people you can depend on and having a community that you can live in when things aren't so bad and when things do get bad, you know that everybody's got each other's backs and that's harder to find. Right. Interesting uh, perspective. Thank you, Simon, for calling. Shachi, I wanted to ask you uh, around the, the survey, how does BC compare with, with other provinces? Since we are ground zero right now, uh, it's our turn in the barrel again for wildfires. Well, and Dan, you said it exactly and precisely. It's, it's, it's we're in the barrel again. And so British Columbians and Albertans, more so than people in other parts of the country, are far more likely to say that wildfire threats are something that they take into consideration in terms of do we move, do we stay. Nearly a fifth of those in this country say they would consider moving if they felt that there was a place that was safer from the threats or the impacts of wildfires. Of course, Certain areas uh, keep getting schwacked over and over again. I think all of us, um, me in a previous life as a journalist, the two of you all covered the the legendary and and very tragic Kelowna fires of 2003. It feels like a generation later. This has come full circle. But when we think about the places that we also consider, quote unquote, safe, Um, Metro Vancouver, the impact of smoke and particulate on our lungs and for those who are prone to asthma, Vancouver Island, which has had no uh, shortage of, of impacts around wildfires flaring up there. I think the broader question is, where is safe? What does safe look like? Mm hmm. Well, that's what we were hearing from Simon. Like, you know, where do you move to if you're going to move? Because there'll be uh, some other um, natural disaster, perhaps, to have to deal with. Rob is on the phone line. Rob is in Vancouver. Good afternoon to you. Hey, good afternoon. And what are your thoughts on our discussion this afternoon? I was thinking it would be really interesting if you could get a lawyer on to talk about this aspect. Um, You know, a person called in earlier, an hour or two ago, he was saying, if the authorities don't have the capability to fight the fire, then an individual has the right to stay and and fight the fire. I think a counterpoint to that is I'm pretty sure that government, police, wildfire service have a duty of care to protect the life of the citizens. So if they were just to allow people to ignore an evacuation order and stay or return to their property to try to fight the fire themselves as just an individual, and they were to get seriously injured or killed, you know, they, if they're injured or if they're killed, they're, some relative of theirs could sue the government, the police, the wildfire service, the fire department, whoever, for negligence. Um, I think that's a real factor and something to keep in mind. You know, it's it, it's more complicated than than some people mm-hmm. are painting this to be. You know, um, yeah, so that would be interesting. I could be wrong. You could get a lawyer on to discuss the legal ramifications of if authorities just allow certain people to ignore an evacuation order and go fight the fire, a wildfire, on their own. Rob, we appreciate your call. Very good suggestion. Uh, Hopefully there is at least one lawyer or two that is listening right now or somebody can make a a legal referral and let us know. Um, I suspect that the answer may include the phrase, it depends. But there we are. Uh, Cindy is in Lumbee and joins us on the line. Uh, Cindy, what's your situation? Um, I experienced this when Burns Lake, south of Francis Lake, was on fire. And it seemed like they were just letting it go, letting it burn. Um, but it's terrifying to be in there. It's terrifying. Um, I heard stories in California about people that were trapped in there, and it was just too hot. They said, don't send anybody in to rescue me. My tires are melting. I can understand the dangers of it. But when they get in there and shut you down and shut you out of your houses, it's terrifying for the people to wonder if they've got anything left. I mean, they're sitting there, and they just have no idea if their house is burned up. There's no communication in that regard. They just sort of, and they said, like, they lit the black back burn, the ones in the shoe shop, they lit the back burn, and then they all left. Well, people are supposed to think that somebody's got to be fighting this fire. Somebody's got to try to stop this thing from burning everything that's left out. Um, they said that they went home, and they quit at 6 o'clock. Well, in the old days, everybody says, oh, no, we didn't fight fires like that. They pulled them out of the bar, and they kept going until the fire was out. So, of course, the people look at this and say, this is a new concept. You're just not letting us in. But they let in people that 
are feeding animals and spreading, uh, selling food or, or not, or giving out food. I don't know what the thing is, but they won't let CBC News in there. You know, like they don't let anybody inside to say what's happening in there. So the people outside that are terrified. Um, so of course people are going to stay and fight because they've heard how it goes. This is every fire that I've heard. Like the one down south, the one. Cindy, I'm going to jump in. Forgive me. Uh, we're just running up to the end of the clock. We want to get one more word in with uh, with Shachi Curl. Shachi, and, and for people who want to look into this a little bit more, um, um, is there? Uh, I guess what would be the big takeaway that you you would you would uh, share with people today about your latest survey? Quickly, more than one word though, but quickly, I will say this: um, despite the, uh, I, th- I think the the shock and the experience of Canadians coast to coast in terms of what they've been experiencing and how they've been affected personally by wildfire impacts over the last few months, we're not necessarily seeing much movement in the number of people who say that climate change is a fact and that it is human caused versus those who are inclined to say that it is a fact, but not necessarily human caused or Mm. those who still think it's a theory. So it's not yet at least moving the needle much on that. You've still got fully a third of Canadians who are not entirely convinced that climate change is human caused. And I think That's we'll leave where, it there for yes, pause. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Shashi. Thank you, Shashi. Shashi Curl is uh, with the Angus Reid Institute. I'm Belle Puri with Dan Burrett. And that is it for our show today. Thanks to everyone who joined in.